please find a seat? Ask the delegates to please stand and ask Brother Marvin Talston, uh, Taylor, one of our vice presidents, please give the invitation. Brother Taylor. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the night's nice rest and for this new day with all of its opportunities for service. We are thankful for the labor movement of Mississippi, for all our dedicated people that go to make it up. We trust that our meeting together on this occasion will be beneficial and helpful in all our areas of life. May we go back to our respective communities with increased knowledge and skill to do the job that needs to be done. Lead us ever to do thy will, in Jesus' name. On behalf of the Mississippi EFL-CIO and the Department of Organizing, Region 7, I want to say that we deeply appreciate the wonderful turnout for this conference today. And before we get into the day's business, I think the appropriate thing to do would be to of each person present to get up and introduce himself or herself, let us know who you are. We have some very prominent people in this meeting today and we don't overlook somebody. So we'll start at the back with Brother Jones. Doing the, helping us out with the registration. Now we are registering everyone with a name and address, the organization they represent, and that will be made available when the, after the meeting's over with, you will receive uh, minutes of this meeting along with the names and addresses of the people present. We have um, a couple of announcements to make before we begin the business at hand. Uh, a gentleman with the Union Life Insurance Company advises me that he would like to give away a TV set at the end of this conference, so in addition to three cups of coffee and a can of beer this afternoon, you will have an opportunity to put your name in the pot and draw for this TV set for the three dollars that we picked up off the out here this morning. So you will get us something with your money. Now, this is going to be a most difficult meeting to control, and I'm going to have to ask the cooperation of all you present to make sure that we put a well stay on schedule and that we accomplish the purpose of the conference. Now, I don't think there's any need for me to go into a great deal of detail with you as to the purpose of the conference. We've communicated with most of you. I might say that this meeting is a follow-up of a conference that we had on July the 28th to determine whether or not there was uh, sufficient interest uh, uh, in our international unions to make an attempt to set up a coordinated organizing effort in the state of Mississippi. And at that meeting, we had very good response. Those people present uh, indicated a desire to put forth such an effort. And at that time, we set the date of the conference we're beginning here this morning. Then we proceeded to communicate with most of our international unions that we felt that would be interested in such a project in Mississippi. And in approaching the conference, we felt that we should deal with this problem in two parts. You've received in the mail, or you picked up this morning, an address by Dixon Piles to our last conference in which he outlined a, what you might say, a new legal approach to the question of organizing here in the state. And a 
Of course, IBEW was the union that initiated the suit that we are referring to. And because of the, of the success of that approach in Mendenhall, we might say we have delegates present here today from that local union, that we felt it was important enough to ask the legal counsel of our unions to come sit with us this morning and to listen and participate in a discussion concerning a new approach to dealing with the organizational problems from a legal point of view. We have Mr. Lewis Harris, uh, the general counsel for, I mean, Tom Harris, I'm sorry. Right, got you mixed up with Lou the poster, right? We have Mr. Tom Harris, the associate counsel for the FLCIO with us on the left. Mr. Lou Sherman, the general counsel of IBEW, who handled the legal aspects of the Mendenhall situation. And Mr. Dixon Pyle, a Jackson attorney who worked with IBEW in this particular situation. Many of you present here this morning I've been doing organizing work in the state of Mississippi, and I don't have to tell you what many of these problems are. I'm sure that all of you present realize in this state, we have a conspiracy that begins in the governor's office and ends up down at the local community where the business community, our state government, and our local governing authorities come together to defeat our efforts in bringing organizing or the trade union movement to the unorganized workers of this state. This is the situation we're confronted with. I'm convinced, and I'm sure many of you are, that if we can find a way to break up these conspiracies, whereby we will have any contest simply between the employer and our unions, that the workers of this state will join the labor movement, you might say, overnight. So with this thought in mind, we've arranged an agenda this morning whereby we will spend the better part of the day in discussing the possibility of a new legal approach, an approach that has already been used to a great deal of success by the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers right here in Mississippi, just south of here in Mendenhall with the Universal Manufacturing Company. Now, before I introduce the gentleman that will lead off on the discussion, I want to briefly discuss the agenda for the conference with you and hope that we can get some agreement and understanding on how we'll proceed. We'll have a coffee break, about 10. Coffee will be served in the back room. And I've already told you, Mr. Sherman, Mr. Harris, and Mr. Powell will lead the discussion. We hope that this phase of the discussion can be over about 3 p.m. We'll recess for lunch at 12 noon, come back at 1.30. We hope around 3 p.m. that the lawyers will have completed their discussion and give the delegates an opportunity themselves to raise some questions. This, of course, includes the lawyers present in addition to the three up here. We hope to recess around 4 p.m. Coffee will be served. The Brewery Workers International Union uh, will serve beer. Then we hope to reconvene at 6.30 p.m. We're giving you an opportunity to get something to eat and also drink some coffee and beer. Then we hope to have a, a two-hour session tonight, this evening, 6.30 to 8.30. Now, we hope at the evening session that we begin, can begin the discussion and the plans of the second phase of the conference. This part of the conference will be devoted to laying plans for putting together a concerted organizing effort here in the state. Mr. Alan Kessler, uh, assistant to Bill Kirch of the organizing department will lead that discussion and then we'll have people from that department, uh, organizing department also involved in the discussion. It's going to take a lot of time. We hope to reconvene again at 9 o'clock in the morning. 
with a continuation of plans to put together the coordinated effort. And if we're lucky, we hope to, hope to get you out of here by 12.30 or 1 o'clock tomorrow. Now, the reason that we put this program together in this fashion is this. We know that many of you would like to get out, <coughs> traveling, driving, have planes to catch tomorrow afternoon. And if we can get you to agree to an evening session tonight, then we think we can get you out of here around noon tomorrow. Disagreeable? Okay. So ordered. So much for that. Now we have with us this morning, as I've already told you, the General Council of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to him now at this time. Okay. Well, they'll let us know. Uh, is there coffee out there? Somebody check. Maybe if the coffee is there, we have that coffee before we begin, then we don't get an interruption. Hmm? Set up for the coffee? I told him at 10.30, we got 30 minutes. All right, we, we can take 30 minutes. Lou, when Lou, Lou, how much time do you think it'll take, Lou? About 30, 35 minutes. 35, so we'll let him make his presentation and then have the coffee break, and then we'll pick up from there, okay? <laughs> Mr. Chairman of IBW. <laughs> President Ramsey, distinguished members of this conference, I want to get right to what we're going to talk about today and discuss first what the general nature of my remarks will be. Uh, I consider my job here to give you a report of the facts and the law in this particular situation and to relate it up to the general problems of organizing. I think what's perhaps even more important is as President Ramsey has indicated to you, there'll be an opportunity to question back and forth. I don't know for myself, I hope to have an opportunity here to learn from you. And I'm sure that's true of the other councils who are here, but this will be an opportunity for an exchange of views, which is awfully important, because sometimes the people who are in headquarters offices get a little far away from the realities on the firing line. But on the other hand, the people who are on the firing line sometimes are not aware of the methods and the procedures that are available in other quarters. Now, I have prepared a rather detailed statement, but I'd like to precede it we're making a few general observations. This case, which is known as Universal Manufacturing Company in Simpson County, involved a number of tribunals. It involved the regional director of the National Labor Relations Board, the general counsel of the National Labor Relations Board, the National Labor Relations Board itself in Washington, D.C., Federal District Court in Mississippi, Federal District Court in New York, Federal District Court in New Jersey. But there was, if I may say, another court, in a sense, a court which, in a sense, was the most important one of all, and that was the court in the plant. There was a jury there, people who were working in that plant. And they had to make up their mind whether they were for the union or against it. Now, the presentation of the case to their minds did not involve the simple preparation of documents. It's a little more real sort of place. The company was not content to debate the issues on the facts 
and the merits. They, or their friends, wanted to suppress the union presentation of the case. You know the methods which are normally used to present the union side. They're rather simple. Preparation of handbills, circulation of them, private visits, discussion, and the like. There are no offers of rewards, and there are no threats of punishment. But on the other side, the methods were a little different. When the organizers for the IBW started their organizing, they were not met with learned arguments about why it's better not to have a union. They were met with opposition in terms of the presentation of their case in the form of activity by the police who under the theory that there were traffic hazards try to get them away from the presentation of their case through the handbills. And then there was a little group of people about 12 of them who visited these two organizers in the motel in May of 1964 and suggested in a rather kindly way that they should get out of town or they'd be killed. So you see that the method of argument is a little different in the court of the plan. In addition to that, there were threats punishment. Perhaps the most simple and direct threat, which is the most overwhelming of all, is that if they decided they wanted a union, then the plant would cease being. And there can't be any more final threat than that. There would be no job. And there were different methods used for the presentation of the threat. <coughs> now, one reason why I'm putting it the way I am is that I think that this legal discussion can't be considered by itself. We're not dealing here with art for art's sake or litigation for litigation's sake. The final test is whether the union is organized and secures recognition. And perhaps more than that, whether they wind up with a signed agreement. That's what happened in this case. But there are a lot of steps that took place along the road. And I'd like now to discuss them and their realistic relationship to the organizing work that was done. And I want to make it very clear right at the outset that it is not my intent, nor Dixon Park, to say that here is a new magic wand that will do the job of organizing. It is a method, it is a tool that can be used in tandem or as an additional item connection with the tools that you already have. But no legal method is going to organize a plan. It can only help. The work of the organizer is the final work. And everything that we're talking about has to be considered from that point of view. Now I'd like to relate the various steps in this manner that I have selected, because I can't tell the whole story, it would take too long. This case began as an ordinary union organizing drive in January of 1964. 
The company itself had a plant in New Jersey and had decided to come down to the Mississippi. Now, in later phases of the litigation, we found out one of the reasons why. And I think I might mention that here. That preceding the decision of the corporate officials to locate in Mississippi, they had a study made by a plant consultant whose report finally got into the record of Mr. Powell's stellar work in depositions. And this report is quite interesting because it evaluates the Mendenhall area in terms of a number of considerations. Labor supply, labor rate, supply, union resistance, labor management relations, and the like. I won't go into the whole report, but I will indicate that the analysis of the labor conditions in the area contain this informative statement under the phraseology attitude. Highly receptive and cooperative. No unions in area. Prefer none, but are not radical. We think that the analysis of the labor situation in the area has something to do with the location of the plant here. And we also believe from what we ascertained in terms of the evidence in this case, that a calculation or estimate was made in terms of the balance sheet and the operating statements of the company, that they could figure on five years of immunity to labor organization. Well, it didn't work out that way, and that's one reason why I'm here today, to tell you about it. Now, in March of 1964, the plant superintendent delivered a speech to what we call a captive audience. And perhaps the most significant thing in that speech from the plant was a statement, kind of a catchy statement, that the key that opens the door can close the door. And strangely enough, in the two local papers, at about the same time, I suppose on the theory that great minds run in the same channels of thought, a similar phrase was used in an implied warning to people in the plant as to the lack of wisdom of dealing with the union. The IBW filed charges with the National Labor Relations Board and the case was processed through to a settlement. There was some posting of a notice which had about as much effect on the situation as a pea gun would on an elephant's hide. In April and May of that year, there were a number of incidents of threatened violence against the organizers, police interference, and in particular, the incident that I mentioned at the beginning about the visit of the 12 people to the two organizers who were told that uh, the importance of their continued existence that they leave the area. Now they weren't exactly lilies, so they called up the sheriff and he didn't come for quite some time. They also called the FBI, and he did come. When he came, the folks left. They were in the back, Norman Beale. And he told them that he couldn't offer them any protection, which was absolutely true. And he also told them that he didn't think they were fooling, that discretion was the better part of valor, and perhaps they'd better go back to Jackson and organize from there. 
Uh, finally, the sheriff made his presence known, and he was quite relaxed about the whole thing. He said there wasn't anything he could do about protecting them. He didn't have that many people. And he assured them that if anything happened, he would investigate, which was not very comforting. Now that word reached Washington. The Office of International President Gordon Freeman and Paul Menga, who's the director of manufacturing operations for the organization. And there was a rather strong expression of views, which I will not repeat here. But the decision that was made at that time was that we would have to utilize every legal resource available to permit the continuation of the organizing effort. Now that meant the commitment of resources, money and the like, and I might say that President Freeman asked for no guarantees of success or anything of the sort. But what he did expect, and what I think he got, was a vigorous and intensive effort to try to do what we could with what was available. Now, I might say, we indicated to the regional office of the board that the rule of great minds running in the same channel just wasn't a good explanation of the coincidence of statements as between the newspaper editors and the uh, plant superintendent, that they were kind of working together, we thought. Well, after a good deal of delay and reluctance, they actually went up and spoke to the newspaper editors who told them that they were exercising their freedom of the press. And the person who was sent up from the regional office came back, made a dutiful report of one sort or another, and that was the end of that. Now, when this Civil Rights Act proceeding, which I'm going to come to very shortly, was filed, it was followed by what we call the law of discovery proceedings. And that means that prior to trial, the lawyer for the plaintiff has the right to use the procedures of the federal rules which permit the questioning of witnesses under subpoena, and that means company witnesses, and the subpoenaing of records which are in their possession. Now, what came out of the deposition was very interesting in this regard. As I've indicated to you, the board could find nothing that was wrong. It was just freedom of the press. But the deposition showed something else. The deposition showed that a high official of the company in the East had proceeded to a city in the South where their distinguished legal counsel had his office, had picked up the materials and his instructions, and then proceeded to Mississippi, where he had a dinner at a country club with the plant superintendent. And very strangely enough, there was somebody else there. And who do you think it was? It was the newspaper editor. We think that it is a fair effort that both got the same instructions at the same time. All of this was something that seemed to be uh, one of the sphinx-like mysteries that could not be uncovered by the processes of the National Labor Relations Board, but was uncovered by the deposition procedure. Now, I'm not trying to say this for the purpose of denigrating the board or anybody in it. I have the highest respect for the board from the top down. I do think, however, that with all deference to our desire to be nice and sweet, that the facts are there 
And I think we're going to have to follow where the facts lead rather than where some of our conceptions may lead. Now, as I said, picking up the chronology of this case, there was intensive effort, and I might say it took us quite a bit of time. We finally concluded, and when I say we, I'm talking about Dixon, who was retained here to handle the case at the local level, myself and Charlie Donenfeld in my office in Washington. Did a lot of work over a period of some months to figure out the legal strategy that would be followed and to draft the complaint that was filed under the Civil Rights Act. Now, I know that many of you are not lawyers, but I'm going to take the liberty of being very detailed about this complaint. There are three counts in the complaint that was filed in January of 1965. The case had as its plaintiffs E.C. Fearing and Wallace G. Wycliffe, two representatives of the IBW at the international level who were threatened, as I told you earlier, Billy C. Isaac and Estes Taylor, who were employees in the plant. The defendants were the Universal Manufacturing Corporation of Mississippi, two of its supervisory employees, the supervisors of Simpson County, they were government officials, the mayor of Mendenhall, the mayor of McGee, clerk of the Chancery Court of Simpson County, the clerk of the Board of Supervisors, the clerk of the Circuit Court of Simpson County, the sheriff, the alderman of McGee and Mendenhall, the commissioner of public safety of the state, a police official, and a number of individuals, including a banker, the newspaper editors, and person believed to have been in this group of visitors that I mentioned who gave their gentle little message to our two organizers in May of 1964. Now the first count asserted a claim to redress the deprivation on the color of state law of plaintiff's rights, privileges, and immunity secured by the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. And I'm going to pose upon you and read you the statute. Now this statute is an 1871 law. It's an old law. It's very simple language. Section 1983. Every person who under color of any statute, ordinance, regulation, custom, or usage of any state or territory subjects or causes to be subjected any citizen of the United States or other person within the jurisdiction thereof to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured by the Constitution and laws shall be liable to the party injured in an action at law, suit in equity, or other proper proceeding for redress. And that was the first count. And in it was stated certain of the principal incidents upon which we relied in showing that there had been a violation of this statute. I'm going to leaf through this till I get to the part where we make reference to the activities of Messrs. Fearing and Wycliffe. <clears throat> It said, the plaintiffs have been assigned by the IBW to disseminate information to Universal's employees concerning the provisions of the National Labor Relations Act, to assemble with such employees and advise them concerning problems which they may have in their employment, point out the ways in which the IBW can be of benefit. That in doing so, they were distributing handbills, and to frustrate the plaintiff's efforts, the defendants had formed the group the official name of which we didn't know then. We referred to it as the Citizens Advisory Committee of Simpson County, 
We later found its official name was Universal Advisory Council, having as one of its prime objectives the prevention by all possible means, lawful or otherwise, of the organization of Universal's employees into a union. And then we allege that the members of this advisory council have joined together with officers of Universal, the other defendants, which included the government officers, and with persons whose identities are not now known to plaintiffs, intentionally to discriminate against plaintiffs, to deprive them and cause them to be deprived in the color of statutes, ordinances, customs, and usages of the state of Mississippi of their rights, privileges, and immunities secured by the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, including but not limited to their rights to freedom of speech, press, and assembly secured by the Due Process Clause of said amendment, their rights secured by said amendment to equal protection of the laws within the state of Mississippi, and their privileges and immunities under said amendment as United States citizens to disseminate and receive information concerning federal legislation and to assemble peaceably for the discussion of federal legislation. Acting jointly as aforesaid, defendants and others whose identities are not now known to plaintiffs, acting under color of Mississippi law and authority, have taken action or caused or instigated action to be taken likewise under color of Mississippi law and authority, depriving plaintiffs of their constitutional rights. And among these actions were listed such matters as two police officers willfully preventing plaintiffs from peacefully distributing handbills, acting in concert with universal agents to harass and intimidate the plaintiffs, then this May 24 incident that I've told you about. And then this is important. On May 24, 1964, despite repeated requests for protection, the sheriff willfully and without justification refused to furnish protection to plaintiffs from the threats made against them by certain main defendants and others, thereby requiring plaintiffs to comply with the mob over May. I want to point out to you that in this complaint, we made no reference to the National Labor Relations Act. That wasn't because we don't rely upon the National Labor Relations Act. We do, and we expect to continue to do so fully. That was done because this case is based on the Constitution of the United States. We are not seeking to enforce the National Labor Relations Act through the Civil Rights Act proceeding. As a matter of fact, this is a technical point. You all heard about preemption means the National Labor Relations Board has jurisdiction, nobody else can act. And this would have been one of the legal questions in this case, as to whether we could file under this act of 1871 when there was a National Labor Relations Act. And I'm very pleased to tell you that your Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is not generally thought of as very pro-labor, which has certainly improved in recent years, did decide in another case on the same point, that a suit under the Civil Rights Act is not preempted by the National Labor Relations Act. Now, count two of this complaint was based on section 1985, which is also part of this 1871 law, and I want to read that to you. If two or more persons in any state or territory conspire or go in disguise on the highway or on the premises of another for the purpose of depriving either directly or indirectly any person or class of persons of the equal protection of the laws or of equal privileges and immunities under the laws, then in any case of conspiracy, which is the language that Claude Ramsey's been using here, set forth in this section, if one or more persons engaged therein do or cause to be done any act in furtherance of the object of such conspiracy, whereby another is injured in his person or property or deprived of having and exercising any right or privilege of a citizen of the United States, the party so injured or deprived may have an action for the recovery of damages occasioned by such injury or deprivation against any one or more of the conspirators. And that count repeated many of the incidents and facts which I have previously stated. And then the third count was section 1986, which in pertinent part reads as follows. 
every person who having knowledge that any of the wrongs conspire to be done and mentioned in section 1985 of this title are about to be committed and having power to prevent or aid in preventing the commission of the same neglects or refuses to do so if such wrongful act be committed shall be liable to the party injured or his legal representatives for all damages caused by such wrongful act which such person by reasonable diligence could have prevented now this suit was for an injunction and was for damages I want to tell you something. It was not filed, as some people think, as a harassment proceeding. It was serious litigation intended to accomplish the objects which it sought. We sought an injunction and we sought damages. And I might say that although, as you know, anybody who is a recipient of a lawsuit and has to hire a lawyer is affected by it, that was not the reason why this was filed. And we did not ask for a million dollars in damages. It was a very minimal sum set forth, about $5,000 for each of the uh, parties involved. And there were punitive damages requested. Uh, I think the whole thing amounted to perhaps $110,000. So it wasn't being done for psychological purposes or to frighten anybody. It was done for the purpose which is stated in the complaint. Now, I mentioned to you the discovery procedures under the federal rules. I want to repeat again what that means. It means when you file a suit, you're allowed to get your evidence through the use of court procedures. You send a notice to the other side and they are supposed to respond at a time and a place fixed in the notice. It's not before the court. It's before a notary public and a court reporter, or the court reporter is a notary public. And then a record is made. Now, this is a deposition which Dixon Files took of one of the witnesses in this case. And they've got to bring in records. Now, of course, they can get into a contest and a controversy to whether something should or should not be done. But the duty to respond is fixed by law. And, of course, one of its importance is that it is something within our control, as distinguished from National Labor Relations Board proceedings, where all we can do is ask the government official to do something for us. We get a good, eager, vigorous fellow who's trying to do an honest, uh, I'm sure they're all trying to do an honest job, who's trying to do a thorough and industrious job, why well, that's fine. But sometimes we run into people, and I'm sure some of you have that experience, where, for want of a better word, they don't apply themselves with due diligence. And there's no way to get evidence from people who are trying to conceal it merely by asking them for statements. Something more has got to be done. And in this case, the depositions went forward in March and April of 1965. At the same time, the company had decided, for one reason or another, to make a stipulation for consent election. Now, despite all the pressure, getting back to our little port in the plant, and they were very tremendous. Uh, they used the race issue and all sorts of things. I'm not going to go into detail about that. I'm trying to bring the main structure of this case to your attention. Despite all that, the jury came pretty close to a favorable verdict for the union. The vote was 272 for the union and 287 against. And I say that's a tremendous tribute to the people in the plan who were new to all this sort of thing and who've been put under very heavy economic pressure. And I'm going to all the details about that. They've been put under other kinds of pressure. And I think it's a tribute to the organizing staff I indicated at the beginning, this is not a mere exercise in what we call legal acumen. Uh, we were trying to get the organizers an open road to handle. But 
But our friends in the organizing, I mentioned Paul Manga before, they were a little ingenious. They couldn't get near the place because there were 25 carloads of uh, posts waiting for the guests. And uh, so what they did was they rented a helicopter in New Orleans and had the helicopter come over the plant and hand build that way. Which is my way of indicating to you just this one little incident in the whole thing that there was a tremendous job of effective, skillful organizing going on. Because that should not be put in the shade just because we're talking about the legal aspects of the case. We filed exceptions and objections to the election. To my great surprise, because I think although I've been in this for 20 years, I've had about 10 years in the government before that, that I've got a fairly objective view of these matters, even though I try to represent my client as vigorously as I can, I didn't see how anybody could possibly uphold that election. But I was fooled. They did come out with a decision which uh, said that is as far as the regional office is concerned, that everything was just fine. Just fine. I uh, don't like to use strong language, and I suppose this wouldn't be considered very strong language. But uh, in the brief we filed to the board, which unanimously reversed it, regional directors, we uh, used a phrase which I think perhaps best characterizes what uh, we really thought about it. And that was that the decision of the regional directors had no rational connection with the facts in the case. Well, that's a nice, polite way of saying something, which I think you probably understand. Uh, I was leafing through because I'm rather proud of this sentence. It is respectfully submitted that although these conclusory paragraphs in the regional director's report were apparently drafted in appropriate legalistic form. They have no rational connection with the substantial facts and realities of the instant case. Now, we had filed unfair labor practice charges, which pretty much repeated the same thing that I have indicated in the complaint. And the region director found no basis on which to issue a complaint. For one reason, perhaps more than any other, he seemed to think there wasn't any relationship between this advisory council and the uh, company. But we had in the depositions which we made available to his office a clean cut admission by vice president of the company that if the advisory council ever did anything wrong, why the company would correct it. In other words, the company viewed the advisory council as subject to its direction and control. But the regional director uh, didn't seem to react to that. Uh, but as I indicated at the beginning, it's not my purpose here to criticize him or to gripe about him or anything of that sort. I, I just thought that I have to tell you these things as part of the factual description of this case. Now, what happened was, oh yes, we have all kinds of receipts as a result of the deposition procedures that uh, show the company paid the expenses of this advisory council. And those were made available, but that didn't seem to register either. During the course of this proceeding, and at various stages, there were contempt proceedings going on up in the district courts in New Jersey. Uh, something happened that, to me, was, shall I say, a little heartwarming as a lawyer. And that is that these depositions, which I indicated to you my good friend Dixon Powers was taking with Mike Maine, 
during the time this election campaign was going on, and certain of the statements that were made in the deposition uh, seemed to have some relevance to the election issue, and they were being used by the organizers. So the company's attorneys went running off to Judge Clark, the federal district judge, and thought that uh, all they had to do was go in there and complain that he would suppress the deposition. Well, he applied the law, which was that the depositions were public documents and could be used, and he did not suppress them. So the depositions went forward, and some of the material in them were of great interest to the employees. Now, as we went along, and I'm not going to try to define exactly what it was that did what, but the facts are that the company decided that if we had a majority, they would recognize the IBW. There was a card check made. The majority was disclosed, overwhelming majority. And thereafter, bargaining started. And the bargaining produced an agreement. Now, when it comes to collective bargaining, I don't know anything about it. But from what I'm told, it's a fairly good agreement. <coughs> thereafter, we dismissed the litigation. Now, I'm not going to draw any morals or any lessons from I think as we get into the discussion, there'll be different aspects of it. My purpose here is merely to state in a report form the general outlines of the case, give you some idea of what's involved. I certainly do not come here in the spirit of saying, here, do this and everything is going to be hotsy tatsy. Obviously, this kind of procedure is limited to this kind of a case. Unfortunately, there seem to be quite a few such cases in this area where, as I would put it, the strategist on the employer's side, knowing that the company can only do certain things without running afoul of the federal law, and knowing also that the community pressures, particularly in smaller towns, are quite overwhelming, utilizes those community pressures for the purpose of affecting the minds of the people in the plant where the contest is. Now, the Civil Rights Act of 1871 is quite broad, but it's also quite limited in that you can use it only when somebody is depriving you of constitutional rights under color of law. Now, the color of law in this case was founded upon the actions of the police, the sheriff, and the like. There may be other ways of developing color of law. But at any rate, it is available in certain types of cases, and it has the advantage, as in this situation, of producing a result. Now, it's true that in this case, for example, we never got to the point of having an injunction issued against the company. But that has happened in the case of Wooten versus Ola, where a building trades union secured an injunction, and I might mention that a little bit, because that's an actual case decided by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in a written opinion. Of course, I might say, talking about another distinguished president of the IBW, uh, Mr. Tracy, I was in his office one day when a gentleman came in and uh, was describing his negotiating abilities. He was an international representative, and he was giving Mr. Tracy a blow-by-blow -blow account of what the company said and what he did and so forth. And it was really not at all uncomplimentary to himself. He just kept on talking, and Dan's face got sterner and sterner. And after about an hour of this, he needed to say a word. He finally said, uh, Mr. Blank, we call him by his first name, but I can leave that out. He said, where is the signed agreement? I'm 
boy, do we haven't signed it yet. He says, well, no point talking to me until you come back with the signed agreement. And uh, this is only a decision. In the universal case, we've got a signed agreement. But for its uh, utility in understanding legal conceptions, I'm going to make some reference to what the court ruled in the case of Wooten versus Ola. That's the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals here in First, on this question of preemption, the court said, it is urged that the district court, which issued the injunction against the sheriff, had no jurisdiction to hear this case on the grounds the relief prayed for lies exclusively within the jurisdiction of the National Labor Relations Board. But this overlooks several things. The first is that this case is not between an employer and a union. The second is that in this case, one of the parties is an agent of the sovereign state. No case has been cited to us, no, we found one in which the Labor Board undertook to adjudicate the rights and duties of state peace officers. I might say that in this case, the uh, police uh, told the organizers who were picketing, there was to be no picketing around there. The sole motivation for this forcible interference was made doubly clear by the officers during the ride to jail. You all, the Louisiana deputies said, were warned not to picket. This is a non-union job, and no picketing is allowed. And then as a sort of gentle reminder, this is the court's language, because this is simply retribution, he added, you were warned not to picket. I mean, this is the kind of an attitude which elicits the kind of response which the court gave to it. Uh, the sheriff's effort, says the Court of Appeals in New Orleans, on the trial and before us to make out a case of prohibiting picketing because of the traffic hazard immediately adjacent to high-speed highway could well have seemed to the trial judge to be an afterthought. Now, that's a gentle way of saying something else, you know. But at any rate, there is that decision. So that uh, I think the case that we are talking to you about is on fairly firm legal foundation or situations arise in which this approach can be employed. Now, I want to make another thing very clear, and this will become clear as the discussion proceeds. Certainly, if this procedure is going to be invoked in any other situation for any other union, I'm sure that everybody will realize that it is necessary first to make a very careful selection of the case I mean, a lot of careful legal work before it starts. And we want to make sure, for everybody's benefit, that it is an apt type of situation. And I think the distinguished legal counsel whom we had here at a preliminary meeting last night, is sitting here, will all be very able to help their own organizations in determining what is the best thing to do. Now, with that, I'll leave my remarks to a close, and then we can resume with the rest of the program. Thank you. We uh, understand the coffee is ready and the agenda uh, order. I'd like to get started as soon as possible. We have several people, several of the attorneys that need to get a flight out this afternoon, and we're going to revise our program slightly here this time in order that Mr. Harris might be able to make his presentation and, and still get his flight out about 1.30. We planned originally to have Mr. Piles uh, on at this time to review with you his association with the universal case as outlined by Mr. Sherman. So we will at this time call on Mr. Tom Harris, the associate counsel for the FLC hour for a few remarks. Tom. I think it was very nice of Claude to go to such length to make me feel at home here. 
My uh, great-grandfather, who was an officer in the Confederate Army, served at uh, Vicksburg. After the war, he was one of the founders of the Klan, and while he was busy founding the Klan, he was first chief of police in Atlanta, Georgia, and then sheriff of Fulton County. <laughs> Some of these conditions haven't changed as much in a hundred years as we might wish. I was um, misadvised as to the nature of the meeting. I thought we were just going to have a small group of lawyers here who would uh, discuss the technicalities of bringing civil rights acts and suits of their advantages, disadvantages, and so on. I didn't know we would uh, have the pleasure of so wide a group as uh, we're uh, attorneys are more accustomed to discussing our problems in small groups uh, uninhibited by the presence of people who may know the facts. <laughs> <laughs> Now, what uh, Dixon and Lou are looking for, of course, and I think they are, should be congratulated on their enterprise and ingenuity, is uh, something to supplement the National Labor Relations Act uh, in aiding workers and unions to get the rights to organize which they are supposed to have under the law. The National Labor Relations Act was drafted specifically for the purpose of protecting the right to organize, but the parts that were meant to help workers and unions were drafted in 1935, more than 30 years ago. Uh, in some respects, conditions have changed. Uh, in other respects, those provisions are quite inadequate and have been inadequately uh, administered. Now, the main advantage of that act, apart from the fact that it was drawn to uh, specifically to protect the right to organize, and of course, this, when the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1866 and 1870, nothing was farther from the minds of the authors of those bills than any problem of helping unions or helping labor organizations. The other advantage of the National Labor Relations Act is that the government provides a free lawyer uh, under the Labor Act. Uh, however, um, the unions have often found that that free legal service is inadequate, that if they want adequate representation, they had better move in and intervene with their own attorneys. So at that point, uh, that advantage disappears. Uh, a further advantage, I think, is that the board at present and the general counsel in Washington are sympathetic with the objectives of the act. I think they are trying to make the act effective and that they are trying to devise or some new remedies <laughs> or reinstate some old ones that would make a reality out of the theoretical right to organize. For example, the Burnell Foam decision uh, has been utilized to advantage by unions in a number of cases. Now, under that decision, if the union organizes a majority of people in a plant and demands recognition, and the employer refuses recognition and later destroys the union majority by unfair labor practices, by illegal acts, the board will order the employer to bargain with that union, even though the union's majority has been destroyed by the employer's illegal act. Uh, that has, in some cases, uh, succeeded in establishing unions and plants. It's got a couple of disadvantages. One is that it is slow. It'll take two or three years. Uh, the second follows out of the first, after two or three years, if an employer is ordered to bargain with a union which has been broken in a plant long before, the union is uh, not in what you might call a strong bargaining position to go into negotiations. Now, as I've indicated, the 
Moore and Remedy's also got some terrible disadvantages which Lou and Dixon are looking to supplement. Uh, some of those advantages have been, disadvantages have been mentioned. An additional disadvantage in my view, possibly the main one, is this. The board personnel are for the most part located permanently in a community. Uh, Libus has been in New Orleans since I was a little boy. Maybe he was a pretty good man back in 1937. Was he really? Uh, what happens over the years is that these board people put down roots in the community. They establish roots to the politicians, which makes it very difficult for the board in Washington to control their actions or to transfer them. They establish roots to the local businessmen. They establish ties with the employer lawyers in the area. In some places, they even establish some ties with unions. One difficulty with that is that they establish ties with whatever element is strongest in the community. So that in areas where unions are weakest and are most in need of the protections of the act, the board people are apt to give the act the very feeblest enforcement. On the other hand, they may be much fairer in areas where unions are much less in need of the act, so that there's that anomalous uh, uh, situation. And that applies, of course, also to the judges, the police force, uh, the local and state governmental authorities, so that everywhere we tend to get less than our legal rights in areas where unions are weakest and most in need of those rights, there are occasional areas where unions are strong and where they even get more than their legal rights. Once at Inland Steel, during a strike, the union had a couple of pickets out in front of the plant. The plant manager came along and wanted to go in. The pickets told him he couldn't go in. He insisted. So you know what the pickets did? They called the police. The police came down and told the plant manager that it was illegal to go on a plant during a strike. Now, if we could get that kind of service around here, we wouldn't uh, need to go into uh, some of these more imaginative remedies. Now, what about the Civil Rights Act? I think it is aimed, that one of the main needs for trying that remedy grows right out of a gap in the way the National Labor Relations Act is written. The unfair labor practice provisions of that act apply only to unions and to employers and to their agents. If, unless you can show that a person is acting as an agent of the employer, you can't reach that person in an unfair labor practice case. Occasionally a board may set aside an election because of the activities of people who are not agents of the employer, but the unfair labor practice case reach only employers and people who can be shown to be working on the employer's behalf or at his direction. He has to be the employer's agent. That means that you can't establish an unfair labor practice case. You can't get a board order against, <coughs> against the mayor of a city or the sheriff or the state troopers let alone these citizens groups, bankers, editors, and so on, uh, who may be acting to keep a union out of the community, the board can't reach that uh, unless they can be shown to be agents of the employer. And the agency showing normally cannot be made. Now this problem of uh, an elaborate pattern of behavior where the local officials, the, uh, maybe the development corporation, the rich businessmen in the community, the editors, where they all join together uh, in an elaborate program to keep unions out of the area, uh, seems to be peculiar to Mississippi. <coughs> At least I have not encountered it elsewhere. 
Now, in quite a number of areas, when the union goes in to organize the local sheriff or the deputy, or sometimes the state troops may move in and beat up the organizer and run them out of town, it's quite possible to get a federal court injunction against that, incidentally. But those are sporadic acts. The rather elaborate pattern uh, which exists in Mississippi and which is exemplified in a number of board cases uh, seems to be a peculiarity of this area. Uh, there are uh, reasons to think that uh, even the old blacklist is wide is widely used uh, and passed about among Mississippi employers. Now, f because of this depth and frequency of this involvement of local officials in league with local businessmen, I think the Labor Act may be working less effectively, may be working less well in Mississippi than anywhere else. And uh, it is not adequate anywhere, but it, it may, uh, serve less well here to protect the right to organize than in any, in any other areas. Now, Dixon and Lou I, uh, are, have sought for some way around that, and one device they have hit is this civil rights suit. Now, that has some obvious advantages. The union can control the litigation. The suit can reach the actions of the local officials if they are acting illegally without showing that they uh, are acting under the direction of the company officials. Uh, the suit can also reach private citizens, local businessmen, local editors, if they can be shown to, acting, to be acting with officials, if they can be shown to the legal term is to be acting in conspiracy with these officials. Now, you can reach a number of acts. Uh, you can certainly reach interference with peaceful picketing or handbilling. You can reach the problem of false arrests. You can reach acts of violence. A, a number, another advantage, and to me the greatest advantage, is that in the bringing of such a suit, the union is in control of the litigation and it can take the offensive. It does take the offensive. The local officials, the officers of the employer corporation, the local businessmen and so on, are made the defendants in a lawsuit. They don't like that. Uh, Lou disclaimed any notion of harassment. I don't mind a little harassment. I've seen unions harassed an awful lot by litigation and I'm perfectly willing to uh, harass some of these local officials and employers, and the more effectively, the better. Uh, if it turns out that some of the uh, development corporation funds have found their way into strange places, or if in the course of taking depositions it can be developed um, that the employer may be paying some of the local police officers, uh, so much the better. You will find that such uh, irrelevant facts may make the legal remedy much more effective or that the company may be much uh, readier to make an end of the litigation. <coughs> there are some disadvantages. The litigation costs money, though not much money in proportion to the amounts that have been devoted to organizing in the South or to trying to organize over the last 25 years. Legal costs in these proceedings are quite trivial. There's no assurance of winning the lawsuit. If you bring a damage suit, that would go before a local jury, and your the likelihood of success might be small. If you're seeking an injunction, that is up to the local district judge. Uh, the judges have wide discretion, but by and large, the federal judges are pretty conscientious about enforcing a federal statute if the law is clear, even if they don't agree with it. Uh, a disadvantage is that these suits can, I think, serve only somewhat limited purposes. Uh, they're pretty much limited to getting the government officials out of the picture or making them stop Ill acting illegally. 
a government official uh, is quite free, I think, to get up and make a speech uh, saying that he thinks a union would be bad for this community and that he urges people to vote against the union for this reason, that reason, or the other reason. I don't think you can stop that. All you can stop, I think, is false arrests, interference with picketing, interference with handbilling. Sometimes I notice that they have um, meetings in the city hall, anti-union propaganda meetings. Whether you can stop that, I don't know. Uh, that, I think, presents an unresolved issue under the Civil Rights Act, and rather an interesting one. It isn't clear to me whether you can stop it or not. Also, in such a suit, you can't reach private citizens if they act by themselves and not in collusion with government or city or local officials. Now, I think that's probably true. At any rate, it was true of the suit that uh, Lou and Dixon brought. Uh, to reach actions of private citizens, we would at any rate have to break some new ground that hasn't been broken yet. Now, what conclusions do you reach on this? I don't suppose that all of us lawyers here will reach the same conclusions at all. If you get 20 lawyers together, we couldn't agree on whether the sun was shining. These, these are simply my own conclusions. And uh, they're not necessarily those of anybody else, and they're guaranteed not to be those of all of the other lawyers. In the first place, I'd say that there's no use even thinking about a suit unless an active and fairly successful organizing campaign is going on. What you are really doing with the suit is seeking to protect your right to organize. And unless you've got some organizing going on and unless it's meeting with pretty good success, I think the suit's a waste of time. Uh, secondly, the suit has to be brought very fast. There's no use bringing a suit after the organization campaign has been broken, after the union is out of the plant. Now, I've seen several situations in Mississippi uh, where a suit could have been as well-grounded legally as Dixon's suit. But in those cases, while the union was brooding about it and kicking it around and sending the papers off to other cities and back and forth, uh, the union had been broken in the plant in the meantime. And there's no use bringing suit there. Now that means that the lawyers will have to be prepared in advance that when you plan an organizing campaign in an area, you have got to consider the legal steps as a part of that campaign. Now, I believe that those of you organizing here will be able to anticipate that when you go into particular plants in particular areas, that you're going to meet with this same pattern of resistance, this same pattern of collusion between local officials, businessmen, and company officials that has been met so often. Now, where you anticipate that, I think you have to have uh, your lawyer all ready to file suit uh, the moment that that crops up so that any legal relief you may get will be coordinated with uh, uh, the carrying on of an effective campaign. Now, if these conditions can be met, it, it seems to me that these civil uh, rights actions are worth trying, uh, not as a substitute for the NLF for whatever NLRB proceedings you may file, but as a supplement to them. Now, if the union should be small or ill-financed, which we would hate to see happen, but in that situation, I'm sure that the organizing department of the AFL-CIO and that its legal department would be prepared to recommend aid to the uh, that the AFL-CIO provides some assistance in the situation. Again, though, this has to, again has to be worked out in advance, because if you wait until you get into an organizing situation and then start thinking about bringing a lawsuit and then start thinking about asking the AFL-CIO whether it will help you, at this point uh, you'll be back out in the cotton field before anything ever, has ever happened. 
So I think that Claude's overall program and the legal, the legal part is just uh, an incident to the organizing part, but I think it does need to be carefully coordinated with it at every step. Thanks. Thank you, <coughs> Tom. And we just uh, would like to say this to you, that uh, you provide the money and we'll provide the know-how. <laughs> Um, in reference to what Tom said about the Klan literature, I think maybe I might ought to explain the reason we uh, pass this out. We are not, uh, we don't want to be misunderstood. Let's put it that way. We give you two pieces of literature this morning that have been passed out in organizing campaigns in the state recently. And depending upon the makeup of the workforce, it's the type, the type of literature that's put out. You have another piece that uh, is a reproduction of a <coughs> news story about a union discriminating against Negroes. That piece of literature was passed out down in the Natchez area in a campaign that Ray Allen over here conducted for the rubber workers where the workforce was about 90% Negro. The Klan literature that you have was passed out on the other side of the state over around Columbus where the workforce was predominantly white, about 90% white. So we just wanted to call your attention to the tactics uh, used by the employers in defeating our organizational efforts. And of course, when you get into a situation where the workforce is about evenly divided, another approach is used. Now, at this time, we're going to ask the distinguished attorney from Jackson, Mr. Dixon Powers, for a few remarks. President Ramsey, distinguished attorneys, courageous organizers, ladies and gentlemen. I feel greatly honored to be included on a program where there is so much legal talent assembled from over the United States and so much organizing talent. I really feel humble. Mr. Ramsey, you and Mr. Starnes and the Mississippi AFL-CIO staff are to be congratulated. I believe that this is probably the most important meeting, as far as the labor movement is concerned, that has ever been held in the history of Mississippi. Because if you are able to come up with a possible solution to the organizing problems in Mississippi, then I think that you will have one of the most pro-labor states mm -hmm. in the Union, because underneath this conservative crust, I am fully convinced, is really and truly a liberal spirit on the part of the working men and women of this state. I fully believe that in your hands is the rapid economic advancement of this state. In fact, I don't believe there is any other way that we can raise the per capita income of the state of Mississippi within our lifetimes, except through you ladies and gentlemen here. But unfortunately, the businessmen and women do not believe that to be the case. And it's up to us to get that message over to them. I am one of the few, I guess, in this room who believes that the National Labor Relations Act has outlived its usefulness, that it never was as effective as Jack Shankman and Tom Harris think it was, that it never had the punitive sanctions necessary to impress a Mississippian or a Mississippi business. But as Tom said, I'm somewhat provincial, 
and I may not know what's going on in the rest of the nation. I hear about it once in a while, but I don't know that. But I do know, I think, what's going on in Mississippi. And I would like to tell you what is going on at the present time. Now, most of you organizers, I don't need to tell you because you're a part of it. You are the victims of it. But I do want to tell some of these lawyers. For years, I've been trying to get Jack Shankman down here to stand in front of the furnished door of a state chancery judge when he grants it, when I try to get him to uh, dissolve a, a state court injunction. But I've never been able to get him down uh, here to stand in front of the furnished door. If I could get him and some of these other attorneys down here, in, this, in these courtrooms in here, their attitudes would change considerably, as you well know, and you wouldn't have so much trouble when you call them up and tell them what's going on down here uh, of getting some high-flown uh, legal philosophy about what did you let the judge do that for. <laughs> <laughs> and... <clears throat> I don't want to be critical of any international officers or something like that, but I sometimes stop when we are beset with these problems and wonder, have we got international bankers running labor unions now? And here, I mean, before they can take a position, they have to look at the balance sheet uh, on these things. And I'm not critical of them. Maybe you've got problems. I don't understand your problems. I've got too many of my own uh, to think about. It was a great pleasure to work with Lou Sherman. I wish uh, that the uh, AFL-CIO would send all of its legal counsel for all of the international unions to work with Lou a while on how to work with the lawyer in the field. I, uh, I, would, I kept in close contact with him, and I usually do, and it, and it pays off. Because I know that you people sitting up in Washington, like Lou, looking at this thing as from a, a whole picture standpoint from just a fragmented small area of the photograph. And uh, whenever I, I had problems, I'd call him up. In fact, during this time, I talked to him most, almost every day. And I went to Washington frequently to confer with him. We spent long afternoons arguing about this thing. And his counsel kept me out of lots of hot water in here because he had had lots more experience in, in these matters than I had had. And your general counsels usually do. So they're not all bad. At, uh, at this time, I'm going to ask Mrs. Jewel Roberts, who is the president of the IBEW local at the Universal Plant to stand and I want you to see her and you'll see why we were so inspired while we were working on this uh, case. <laughs> of the local officers and I want her to stand and so that you can also see that uh, we had to win this one. Would you stand up Mrs. Mildred Andrews? Somebody down here wants to know if you have to be a redhead to be an officer of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it helps. <laughs> these, are, these are very fine ladies, and you can see why we were so dedicated to this uh, task of uh, getting them what they wanted down there. Now, let me tell you how we got the way we did in Mississippi. Steve Sosberg ought to know about this as well as... Uh, some of the other lawyers in here, because too often he's up there with the United Auto Workers, and I often tell Walter Russo whenever I can get him to sit down to talk to me, that he's busy going to Miami Beach and preaching to the missionaries. If he doesn't come down here to Mississippi and preach to the centers, and I'm glad to see Steve Sosberg here so that he can look at us centers and find out what our problems are. But I want to tell you, Steve, Jack, I've already told, and he pays no attention to it, as to how we got the way we did in Mississippi. From 1865, at the end of the Civil War, until 1936, we were a, an agricultural community with an agricultural economy. 
we even discouraged corporations coming in to the state of Mississippi by a, a constitutional provision saying that they could not own more than a million dollars worth of assets in the state. We didn't want business, big business in the state. About 20 years ago, Bob Starnes and I was attempting to get some Chamber of Commerce officials to take some action to try to get a steel mill located uh, on, the, on the Mississippi River. And they told us, we don't want any big, big industry in here. They'll have strikes and have lots of kind of trouble. We want a white collar society. But this is changing. And it began to change in 1936 when some of our public officials became aware that there had been for nearly 200 years an industrial revolution going on in the world and that we ought to get in on it. So as a result of that, we concocted a socialistic scheme called Balancing Agricultural with Industry which pledged the credit of the various political subdivisions of the state of Mississippi to the floating of bond issues for the purpose of building plants and equipping them and then exploiting our own workmen by inducing these people to come to Mississippi and operate the plants which we built for them and which we uh, enslaved our workmen to work for so that they would get good profit. That's been going on since 1936, and it is called a BAWI program, Balanced Agriculture with Industry. Now, we have a, a definition of socialism in this state which says that if it helps me, it's damn good government. But if it helps you, it's socialistic, and we don't want any part of it. So uh, to help the workers is socialism. To help the businessman is, is good government. We have a business climate set up by the legislature in this state. Now then, we think to this good day, and we've been thinking since 1936, that if you do not keep unions out of this, of this state, you cannot industrialize the state. So as each of these communities sets up an industrial relations council or a foundation or of some sort of group that is, the purpose of which is to entice uh, outside industry to come and locate in a particular community. And we, I guess, Ed Blair can tell you that we have more <coughs> needlecraft industry located in certain parts of Mississippi and probably anywhere in the world. Jack, is that correct or not? He's not committing himself. Have a lot of them. Have a lot of them, he said. Uh, now, <clears throat> but they're all, they try to keep the wages down low. And they keep them down low by promising these people if they'll come in there in the, at the beginning, that they'll float a bond issue, pay for it with tax money, and guarantee to keep the union out. That's what happened in Mendenhall. And we brought this out. We developed this in our deposition. And that's going on today. Every community, and, and your organizers know it, I don't know whether you lawyers do or not, every community has some sort of an organization which is dedicated to getting industry into the community and equally dedicated to keeping the unions out. And they will promise these people that they will keep the unions out if they'll come into those communities. That's a guarantee that they give them. They call it docile Anglo-Saxon labor. They'll even advertise that. And they brainwash and condition not only the white workers, but also the Negro workers and keep them low. And they will pit the white workers against the Negro workers to, be, to ensure that it's low and to try to keep them from being organized. Now I want to call your attention to some of the things that are going on right today and are happening to some of the people sitting in this room. The first one that I'm going to talk about is Ray Smithhart over here, who is a rubber worker. Stand up, Ray. I want him to see you. A few years ago, up in Ripley, Mississippi, they built a rubber plant up there. While they were building that plant, the IBEW 
A local union in Corinth, Mississippi, came down and put a picket line on it. They promptly granted an ex parte injunction, that is an injunction without notice, to IBW take its picket line off. We filed a motion to dissolve the injunction saying that you haven't got any jurisdiction of this thing because this is within the exclusive jurisdiction of the National Labor Relations Board. This is Lou's doctrine of preemption that he talked to you about. The local judge paid no attention to that at all. He'd already granted the injunction. But he took under advisement in 1960 the question of whether he should dissolve that injunction on the question of whether he had jurisdiction or not. He hadn't yet made up his mind. He still got it under advisement. Uh, and it was, this is one way to keep us from appealing his decision or suing the, the contractor down there for damages for wrongfully securing an injunction. In my opinion, that judge is never going to make a decision on that thing, although he's got a state law that says he can't keep a uh, case under advisement for more than six months. He's had it under that advisement for six years, uh, and he's going to keep it that way. Well, when they got the plant built a few years ago, Ray went up there to organize it. And the first thing, uh, uh, he was advised by the sheriff that they didn't need a uh, union there. Ray disagreed with him, and people then began to follow him around, and a few of them began to shoot up his automobile. And when he complained to the sheriff and the highway patrol in there, they told him the best thing you can do is get out of town. People ought to union that I ought to convince you. And it did. It was pretty convincing. Uh, it was that, these, uh, that they didn't want, somebody didn't want a union up there. All right, recently, Ray went up to Avery uh, to organize the pl plant up there. And when he goes out to try to hand bill, the chief of police comes along and told him, said, you can't do that, you can't handle that, get out, get away. Of course, this was on the right of way, all right. He had every right to be there as well as any other citizen. Uh, you'll have to get over across the, uh, the road, away from where these people are. Well, of course, you, you'd, you'd just be standing there. No cars are coming about over across the road. He couldn't affect the handbill. So he told him, said, no, I'm not going to do it. I, my lawyer said I had a right uh, to do this, and I believe him. And, he hadn't been disbarred yet, and so I might as well believe him. So I'm going to continue to do it. So they arrested him for disobeying the chief of police, for refusing to obey the lawful order of the chief of police who was telling him he couldn't exercise his rights on the First Amendment. They took him to court and fined him. Well, we have removed that to the federal court. And uh, I'm waiting for George Barrett over here and Patterson uh, and, and the international officers up there to look at the balance sheet to see if we can file a, uh, a, a, a civil rights action against him because you've got the basis. You've got under color of state law. They arrested him and tried him and convicted him. That's all you need, under color of state law. And when, whenever they get to look at the balance sheet, well, we may be able to go in do something about stopping that in that community. And, here, and I don't want to be, I don't want you to get the idea that, that I'm critical of any international officers. I'm not. I'm just relating some facts to you. Uh, we need, in this state, we are the only state in the Union who doesn't have uh, a labor department. Now, when Claude Ramsey makes any kind of a statement, regardless of how truthful it is, and everybody knows Claude is fairly truthful, he is as truthful as the times will permit. <laughs> uh, here. They completely disregard, discount what he says because he is a union man. And, uh, you can't believe these union men, according to the papers here. And so, as a consequence, we are not able to get the message that we need to get over to the people because we have no uh, agency to gather these statistics, to make these studies like most of these uh, you people from other states have with your labor department. And I want to throw out for your consideration at this time the establishment of an industrial relations institute or foundation so that we can get some of the experts from these colleges and things to make studies and announce these results of this industrial relations institute and then let Claude comment upon the findings of the Institute in here, because they may believe the Institute, but they're not going to believe Claude. 
so that we can do this. And I'm not going to go into that very, a great deal, but I throw that out for your consideration in, in here, and that will give Tom Harris cold shivers because he, uh, he doesn't like for us to ask little things like that because it costs money. And we always call on him to provide some of it for us. And that's one thing he doesn't like to do is send that money to Mississippi. He wants to keep it in Washington. Now then, I, I want to call your attention to uh, Ed Blair can tell you about this. And once upon a time, they you know, had a conference down here with the Amalgamated Clothing Workers in here, and they asked me to come and talk to him about the, the legal problems in Mississippi in here. And Otis Doggett was alive then. If there was a pair, Ed Blair and Otis Doggett was it. In fact, I never understood what was meant by that unlawful assembly provision in the Constitution and then, until I got acquainted with that pair. Well, I opened up the remarks and said most of the legal problems in Mississippi are sitting right here, Otis Doggett and Ed Blair. And Charlie English has not been back. From, uh, if he's been to Mississippi since then, he hasn't let me know about it at all. I don't think he appreciated my remarks uh, about his men. But in Durant, Mississippi, this, uh, the Amalgamated Clothing Workers had a campaign going on. Now, they have an industrial council up there just like I've been telling you about. The mayor's on it, the uh, public officials are on it. They got to have the public officials, the mayor and the chief of police and the sheriff to make these things work. The bankers are on it, businessmen are on it. Now, uh, they attempted to organize this industry there. The first thing they did was brought in a, a, a detective to find out who uh, in the plant was for the union. Well, they did they got in a squabble about who was to pay the detective. And they, uh, while they were just squabbling about that, the detective got mad about it and uh, wanted to know if he could get him a lawyer to sue somebody. And they, somebody said, well, anybody crazy enough to sue a company in Mississippi except Dixon Bob. And he wandered in and told me his story. Well, this sounded good. And I called up Jack Shankman. And Jack cautiously thought he'd like to hear more about it. And uh, so we got affidavits and information and sent it up to Jack. And then uh, the plant manager got his, his back hurt uh, and up there, and they told him, uh, don't file a workman's compensation case against us if you way raise our rates. We'll take care of it. So they, they took care of him on it. They transferred him back up to his home state and then fired him. So he made his way back down here, and somebody else said, uh, who's a good workman's compensation lawyer? And he found his way into at our office. We've got uh, over 170 cases for the claimant in our office at the present time. Workman's compensation. He told me a story, and so I, of course I recognized this same plant, and I began to ask him some questions, and uh, he was very revealing. He told us exactly how it did. He couldn't hire anybody. Anybody who was to be hired there had to go through this industrial relations council and they checked on him and, and cleared and they told him who to hire. He couldn't, and, and he was not to use the plant telephone to talk about any of this thing. He was to create a pious air, which he did. And even when the labor lawyers would go there to talk to him, they'd take him out in a car out in the woods and tell him what to tell the National Labor Relations Board. Well, I called Jack and told him about that. Are you interested in it? Yes, he was. That sounds kind of interesting. So Jack took the deposition of this ex-plant manager up in uh, uh, another state, a northern state here, and if you want to wonder why this thing works, why well, just read this deposition. He'll tell you this manager tell you how they work it there. And someday Ed Blair may organize that plant. I don't think in my lifetime he will until he stops uh, the, the, the interference of the local community there, the mayor, the chief of police, and the mayor, but someday he might. And uh, he won't live that long either, I don't think. Just ten years ago Ed was shot on an IUE picket line up in Columbus, Mississippi. Now then, I want to tell you what happened here recently to the steel workers. I'm going to give you some of the examples. They, have, they actually, with Bob Starnes' help, organized a steel mill here, but they could not get a contract, and they struck. And here's what happened to some of their people. 
There was a Negro on the picket line, and they and they start out with the Negroes here. His name was Sam States, and this, this is public record. He was a leader of the union movement. The majority of the employees were Negroes in the steel mill there. So at 9.15 on May the 24th, 1966, two uniformed police officers, members of the Jackson Police Force, came to Sam State's home here in Jackson. They didn't knock. They didn't ask to enter. They had no search warrants. They just walked right in his house. They had no search warrants, no bench warrants, no nothing. One of the officers said to him, we have orders to take you in. You cut a man's tires. Well, State said, no, I didn't do it. They said, that don't make any difference. Shut your mouth, Mayor. Don't talk back to us. You did it. Come along. So they took him to the police headquarters. And they took him to the city jail, and they locked him up. They kept him there overnight. Now, no charge had been made. So his wife finally got around to calling uh, other members, other leaders of the union, who in turn finally got around to, uh, uh, to by after, I think, calling the international representative somewhere in Florida. And he said, well, what you need is a lawyer. He was a very quick and perceptive individual. He said, what you need is a lawyer. And, and so they finally got around until uh, they got in to see me, and I got a bondsman and called up and wanted to know what they had charged him with. They didn't have him charged with anything. What do you hold him for? Oh, we just want to find out what he knows about this thing. Been there overnight, so I sent the bondsman around and they let him go. Made no charge of him, but they say, we know you cut those tires and we're going to catch you. Uh, he was taken from his cell on May the 25th, 1966, by two plainclothes officers and brought downstairs to the interrogation room. He was given no advice, as Miranda and Escobedo says you're supposed to do, and those are two cases the United States Supreme Court has passed recently. I don't want to get technical in here. You lawyers, you labor lawyers know about those things, although they don't practice much criminal law. Uh, they, he was given no advice about his constitutional rights, as the Supreme Court of the United States has said they were. He was told that he had cut the tires and want to know why he did it, and then he said, well, if you won't tell us why, we'll tell you. It's because of that union. Get out of it. Get out of the union. Quit, quit doing these things, you're going to wind up in the penitentiary. They brought in some people, as they do, to identify him, and, and they moved him back and forth, and of course, he didn't know what was happening. And about that time, my bondsman showed up, and they stopped the foolishness and let him go. Then, uh, We, we had another man named W.D. Green. He was a white man. So they had a, uh, a one of their white strike breakers in here get a gun out of his car and point it at him and then go down to the, uh, a day or two later, down to a uh, justice peace office and make a charge saying, I may have pulled a gun on him. It's just the other way around. And uh, so... Find out the way to come in now where the lawyer's office was, and they came in, and we went over for a trial. We had all kinds of witnesses, and the JP uh, set this thing when we made the bond and got him out of uh, jail for 10 o'clock one Saturday morning. And we got there at 10 and waited around. Nobody showed up from the other side. So the JP was waiting around. Well, let's wait a little bit longer until <coughs> the company shows up. Well, he didn't show up, and then uh, he, he began to call the company attorney. The company attorney had made the affidavit and sent it and had them signed. And he but it didn't have it. They don't have a county attorney in this county where this was going on. And so he was looking for the uh, the company of lawyer to come over and prosecute the case. He called him up and said, "Come on over here." Said, oh no, I didn't, I didn't know you were going to hold a continue of the case. And he said, "Well, will you agree to continue?" No, we're here. We want to try him. Well, he, he, he says back to the company attorney, he said he won't agree to it. And the company lawyer said, he don't have to agree to it, you can order it. 
Well, he said, I hate to do that to nobody else here except all these union men gathering around. And he said, why don't you come on over here? It'll be all right. You know it's going to be all right. Said, no, I'm busy. Just continue. Well, we insisted, and he hung up, he still was trying to get it. We insisted that we have a trial. Well, he said, I'll dismiss it without prejudice. No, we don't want to dismiss it and file it again when we get out of here and we be picked up. So he finally agreed, and we uh, put the, uh, the defendant on and all of his witnesses and had a trial. And of course, the, 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 only, the, the judge was a counsel on the other side across the town. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> held up some tacks. So you throw these tacks out here, and do this with them, but you've been throwing these tacks out here in these company supervisor yards. I'm going to put a stop to it. Well, I pointed out they didn't have anything to do with this case. Uh, and yeah, this man wasn't charged with any tax uh, being in this thing. And yeah, but uh, uh, he can deny it. I had no objection. And he could tell you whether he did it or not. He denied it. didn't know anything about it. So finally he said, well, it looks like the evidence is in your favor. I'm going to have to dismiss this thing. So I said, all right. He said, I'm busy right now, but he said, if you'll send me over a judgment, I'll enter it. So we wrote, went back, rushed back to the office, this Saturday afternoon, wrote up the judgment, sent it over that Monday morning. By that time, he talked to the uh, company lawyer, and he decided, no, he couldn't sign. He had things under advisement. He took it under advisement about two weeks. He sent it back and said, I can't sign that. So I don't know what status uh, the steel workers are in, but... <clears throat> The, the, the general counsel of the steel workers and their officers are looking at the budget. And frankly, I think we're going to lose that in the fight. I don't think the steel workers are going to find that they have sufficient funds, although we have under color of state law of these people being arrested. And, and the brewery workers in here, and, and they, they've really had a time, and some of them are here, and the general counsel is, uh, is here, and he can go back, I guess, and look at the balance sheet the rest of them I get to uh, talking about this thing. The Whitey Munster here has had some problems. Uh, brewery workers got an election and won in three distributors here. And they struck one of the distributors. And uh, they, uh, they began to pick up our people with, and make no charges against them. They did finally get around to making two or three charges against some of them. But most of the most part, especially where the Negro brewery workers were concerned, the police would walk into their homes time and time again and pick them up and take them to the, uh, uh, to the police station with no charge and question them about vague charges that the, that the brewery uh, beer distributors had made. Finally, it wound up with a, uh, they had one struck and two others were, uh, hadn't been struck and they were still trying to negotiate. Finally, the man that was struck said, if you all don't get in this boat with me, I'm going to put beer on the uh, on the market, 75 cents a case lower than you're selling your beer. And you know what they did? What the other side did? And they, of course, the union had not struck them in this. They just locked out all the rest of the employees. Oh, we sent them around to get their unemployment in here. You know, it took us two months just about to get that. Well, we got it. Had to take Claude Ramsey and Bill Stanley and some of our friends around there. And we won that case because the company didn't show up and contest it. But it took a long time, and we finally got it. And by, uh, by this time, I think the union is, uh, the employees here are more or less on the ropes, and they've been told that if you're going to stay in the union, you may wind up in penitentiary. But we've still got a few criminal charges we're going to have to clean up. Well, now, the brewery workers, under the Civil Rights Act, have a, a cause of action under state law for the things that have been done to them. All right, we got the upholsters, and Johnny Ray is back there, and I'm not going into details, but that's too horrible for me to tell you about it. Johnny Ray can tell you one at a time so it don't shock you as to what they've done to him up there. But the district attorney in that district, a man named Doty up there, that did what he did to Johnny Ray and the upholsters in Pontotoc, Mississippi, uh, he's the, he's the uh, city, uh, he's the local attorney for company up there. He's also the district attorney, and he's the one that's after Ray Smithart over in, uh, in Monroe County on, on the same thing. So Ray, Ray can feel a good deal of assurance that he's the district attorney is going to uphold the law 
and, and here he's unbiased. Unions make no difference one way or the other to him. He's just going to uphold the law. But uh, he, he just about ruined the upholsters in there, as Johnny Ray can tell you. <laughs> now the chemical workers uh, have a problem up in uh, in uh, Clarksdale, Mississippi. They organized a cotton oil mill up there. They got some white workers and some Negro workers up there, and they. Uh, got this thing pretty well categorized and easy to, to handle up there. All the Negro workers get a dollar and twenty-five cents an hour, regardless of what they do, and the white workers get from a dollar thirty-five up. So they do the same type of work and things like that. So Dave Feller and I have filed a suit under Title Seven. We haven't said anything about that. We filed a suit under Title Seven on the basis that they are discriminating against the Negro workers. And in the employment up there, and we got the union attempted to file it in the uh, it's this Fair Employment Practices Commission up there, so the union wasn't a person in the contemplation of the act. And we filed a suit, and they finally changed their attitude and said, Yeah, maybe they are a person. And the judge said we were a person, and now we go on from that uh, to see where we come out uh, and see if Negroes doing the same type of work as white people, we can get the same pay. That's what the law says, but I've been practicing law for 26 years, and I don't always take it for granted that what the law says is going to, it's going to come out that way. Sometimes it doesn't. I'm almost as cynical as Tom Harris. Now, recently, the sheet metal workers are conducting a campaign against the national uh, manufacturer who has a plant in Grenada, Mississippi, their counsel called me up from Houston, Texas, said, we're going to put an informational picket on this plant up there. He said, my people won't come to Mississippi unless you'll go with them, put on the picket line. Well, why don't you come with them? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm not going to stand in front of that furnace. <laughs> so I said, yeah, well, I'll go with them. So we went up there, and here I hear a lawyer sitting in a car on the picket line while two guys walking up and down advertising that these people don't pay their employees very much, and of course everybody knew that anyway. Uh, and in there, but we thought we'd tell them again. So while we're sitting there, we, we're walking along the right of way, off, the, off that, our cars are parked off the uh, right of way, along comes the highway patrol. And he stops these people, says, you're creating a traffic hazard here. They're way off the paid portion of it on the right of way. And so the uh, stand up with one of these uh, cheap metal workers, people that were out there on that picket line, stand up here. They are. Yeah, they were out there on that day. They said to this highway patrolman, "Well, you'll have to see our lawyer. We just he he tells us we can carry this sign up and down there. We don't know much about him in here, but he seems to know what he's doing. He had been this bar, they tell us. So he walked over and said, Mr. Files, you have to take those tickets now." So why? So well, they're creating a traffic hazard. I said, how are they creating a traffic hazard? They're walking along the right of way, minding their own business with a sign. When they say nothing, well, he said the people are slowing down to read the sign. <laughs> so I said they're creating a traffic hazard. The rest of them said, oh no, no, we can't do that. He said, what did you say your name was? I said, I'm Dixon Piles. And he saw. Uh, he said, are you the one that was down there in Memphis all the student Tim's? Yeah. He said, wait a minute. So he went back and got on the radio, talked for about 15 minutes. He came back. He said, would you mind coming up to the station up here and talking to the man in charge of it? And he said, yeah, I'll go up there. And so we went up there and said, he got up there in a real tough highway patrol. He said, I'm not going to put up with any foolishness from you. No, sir. I don't need any foolishness either. I tell you what, if you want those pickets down, you go out there and arrest them. I'm not going to take them down. I think they're exercising their right under the First Amendment. He said, What's that? <laughs> what? Well, that's the right of freedom of speech, freedom of press. And he said, Well, I'm not going to put up any foolishness with you people in here. If they ain't down in the morning, 
JLA go? And I said, well, why, what's wrong with right now? Go ahead and arrest him. But I tell you, if you do, I got that lawyer up there to promise that I could sue you. If, you. if you do that, just like I did Tim. So they never did arrest him. They finished out walking the picket line. So they decided that that turned out so well, they'd do it again. And by the way, uh, the sequel to that story is, I don't know whether these sheet metal workers know this or not, we had the bar convention here not too long ago, and the governor came down to it. God knows the governor was my life. And he said, Dixon, what in the hell are you doing up on a picket line in Grenada? <laughs> well, how do you know about this thing? He said, well, they called me. <laughs> and uh, they, they said, you said you were going to sue them or something. And I said, well, you better leave him alone. Maybe he'll go away, because he will sue you. <laughs> So later on, so in a few weeks, these, this turned out so well for the sheep well, metal worker, they decided to do it again. So this time, the highway patrol was staying completely away from them. They didn't want to get sued. So uh, long comes a highway department worker this time, and he says, you have to take those uh, uh, picket, those in off of that picket line there. Why? He said, well, we have a law that you can't advertise on the right of way. And I said, we got a law too. The Constitution of the United States said, we got a right of freedom of speech. Did you ever hear of that one? And I'm not going to put up any foolishness. You can just have to take that picket sign now because you're advertising on the right of way. I say, what you do, if you want them down, you go over and arrest them. He said, I'm not a policeman. I said, well, you make a citizen's arrest. And the minute you tell them they're under arrest, I'll take them down. I'll tell them, get in the car. We'll go by the courthouse and sue you on the way out. <laughs> So he went on back, and in a few minutes, along came a big bunch of workmen, and they tore up that whole highway right in front of me, put up signs. <laughs> and while these people were just, more people there than you ever had to move a car. <laughs> so these are things that can happen to you. This is under color of law. All of these in here, and when your general counsel and your general officers get through checking the balance sheet, if they'll ever sue, we'll sue. Thank you. Thank you, Dixon. I would remind all of you that the gentleman here is taping the meeting, and that uh, you, if you would like, <laughs> you like, if you would like a copy of the tape, it can be had by making an application with us in the bargain here. I think you might want to play this one back on a couple of occasions. Now it's 12:15, and. Uh, we should recess for lunch now, I think. Do we have any announcements to make? You want equal time? I do, just not equal time. That Would you come up to the podium, please? We want to get it on there. Right. Time, because that would be unfair. I know you're all hungry, but I've got to catch a plane, and uh, I had to say a word. I, I, I do want to say one thing to start with, and that is to quote Clarence Darrow, who once said that it's better to be a friend of a working man than a working man. And we all know that's true. And while Dixon was talking, he started out and he picked on me first. I don't know why. Poor Walter Ruther and me. I was thinking of a story of a friend of mine who was about 60, 65 years old, and he had a very serious coronary. He lay at death's door for about five months, and then miraculously, due to wonder drugs and a very fine doctor, he recovered completely. So he got ready to go home, and he said to the doctor, do you have any special instructions for me? And the doctor said, my boy, you're in good shape. Live a normal life and go home. So he went home, and his wife greeted him, very lovely to him. And they sat around. They had a nice dinner. He said to his wife, what do you say? Let's go upstairs. And he found out that his wife would not have anything to do with him once they had left the ground floor of the house because she thought the exertion would kill him due to that heart attack. And she explained to this good gentleman, this friend of mine, that she would have to see a note from the doctor before they did anything more strenuous than shake hands. So he went back to his doctor and he explained this terrible situation to him, and the doctor said, okay. Sat down, he wrote, and he said, John Smith is completely recovered from his coronary. As a matter of fact, he has the body 
and the physical energy of a boy of 19. He said, now what's your wife's first name? He said, would you mind making that to whom it may concern? <laughs> necessary in Dixon's case because he later made it to practically everybody in the room, but I want to tell you something. <laughs> I used to be a lawyer in the field, and before that, before I had the misfortune to become a lawyer, I used to be an organizer for the garment workers, and I've been slugged, mugged, and bugged. I uh, grew up in the state of Virginia, which is not quite an industrial state of the north, and uh, I know something of your problems here, and I know it's tough, and you people here who are organizing here are heroes. However, that does not mean that the international unions, the international officers, and the international general councils are uh, money counters and uh, are not sensitive to your problems. We have only two vice presidents in the UAW, and we can't spare either one of them. But one of them went down to Hartwell, Georgia, and got the hell beat out of him in an organizing campaign down there. Walter Ruther himself was hung in effigy down there. That means he wasn't really hung, but something that looked like him, a dummy, was hung. Uh, we spent about $15 million on a strike in Kohler, Wisconsin, and we spent a lot of money all over the country to help people like migrant workers in California, and we are ready to help in any concerted drive in the South that we can help on. We have been counted. We are ready to fight. We are not counting money. We will not run in every time somebody says there's a civil rights suit, because I think that's the way to put an end to this whole doctrine. We're going to be just as cautious and, to use Dixon's word, just as cynical as Tom Harris. Uh, but we need guys like Dixon on the firing line. And when they get battle fatigue, we ought to bring them up to Detroit or Washington and give them a martini sometimes and let them rest. Thank you. The other attorneys present will get an opportunity to rebut this afternoon. Uh, do we have any announcements? Do we have anyone else that's going to have to get that early plane about 1.30? Steve, lawyer. you go in among the lawyers. Any other lawyers? All right, let's recess for lunch and see if we can be back here at 1.30. Delegates, please be seated. While we are waiting for the delegates come into the hall, I got an announcement to make. For the benefit of the Glass Bottle Blowers Union. Are they present? Bottle Blowers, are they in the house? I'll hold it till they get you. There he is, there he is. Father complained with me earlier this morning about the, the fact that I'd already made a boo-boo. Announced the fact that uh, beer would be served this afternoon in metal containers. Well, I took this complaint up with the representative of the Brewer Workers Union, and he has made the necessary changes, and the beer will be served in glass bottles. <laughs> now, now it's up to the steel workers to file their complaint. I don't believe they're present. We uh, also have sufficient copies of Dixon Piles' of speech. Uh, available. Those of you that didn't get one, we've got some up front. So what the remarks he made at our previous conference on the 28th. Most of you, I think, have already received it, but if any of you missed it, we've got some up front here. Before we uh, begin the afternoon session, we have the gentleman with us that's going to give a TV in the way here at the conference, sitting up here on the... Did he leave? <laughs> Well, we, we thought we'd have the drawing tomorrow and give him an opportunity to have a few words to say to you, but you will have to be present to win. So I think he went off to lock it up when he found out we wouldn't give it away. To, here he is, to Lamar. Come on up here, Brother Wincy. 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 Yeah. I'm one of the babies in the uh, organized movement here in Mississippi, so far as uh, being organized. I think we probably had the uh, distinct pleasure of being the first of the office and professional workers in the insurance uh, industry. Now, we've had the distinct pleasure of dealing with a, a good number of the fine representatives here, a number of the brothers, uh, for the last year and a half uh, in the state of Mississippi throughout the entire state. And uh, 
we are very happy to be a part of this great movement that is moving forward in a very, very great way uh, as is evidenced here today. Uh, it's my pleasure to be able to uh, show my appreciation and, and enjoyment of dealing with the union labor movement in general. Uh, the fact that I'm a little bit different than the rest of you, you deal with yourself, and I deal with all of you. Therefore, I have this little 16-inch TV set, and we visited with the electrician's meeting yesterday, and uh, Mr. Dees declined from uh, drawing. He's one of the business agents up in, uh, up in uh, Corinth. And he declined from drawing, so he deferred to a lady. That lady drawn, uh, drew, and she drew her name, if you please. <laughs> so Dees wants her to cut the radio in half, you understand? Uh, because he was responsible for her having gotten his radio in that, in that instance. Uh, I would like to read to you uh, a brief uh, letter here from international representative of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, uh, Mr. Edward Clinch, uh, relative to our company and our operation. And since it is new, and to some of you it's brand new, I know the idea is. But we're a fully organized agency, and I think that'll be a trend. I don't think we'll be the only one a great long time. I think there'll be uh, other uh, insurance companies and so forth that will catch the uh, ball and go forward. Of course, they can wait uh, for a short period of time if they want to, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this, Mr. Edward Clinch, international representative up in, uh, in this particular instance, York, Pennsylvania. Uh, of course, I don't, I don't ha have to go that far to get a uh, letter like this, but I did like it. It's, it's new, uh, a new approach. It says, I give full endorsement and recognition to the Union Labor Division of the American Income Life Insurance Company for their superb pay paycheck protection plan offered to mem members of organized labor. In keeping with the tradition of practicing what we preach, I herald the important fact that American Income is a fully organized, nationally represented union labor company. The programs they offer are specifically formulated to fit the needs of our local membership. And he goes on about union labor on uh, coverage and protection. Uh, but we are here and uh, enjoying this meeting and hope to, in some small way, contribute to somebody's well-being uh, and maybe a second set that you can have there in your bedroom or move out and carry it in your office. And so we'll have that for you tomorrow, and uh, we'll have every uh, member who is registered, and we'll have a drawing of some impartial soul. And one person out of this group, we wish it could be everybody, of course, but one group, one person out of this group will uh, walk away with this nice little 16-inch TV set. Thank you, Brother Andrew. Andrew, we can hold you here tomorrow now. Well, we reached, when we recessed for lunch, we had just completed the presentation of the three panelists. <coughs> and we promised the other attorneys present that they'd have an opportunity to rebut or have a few words to say if they so wish. So at this time, I'm going to make an inquiry if any of the other attorneys present would like to have a word to say. I understand if Mr. Barrett has to catch a plane, probably you'd like to come first, would you, George? George Barrett, for representing the Rough Workers. Uh, I'd just like to, I'm not asking for equal time. I agree with a lot of things that Mr. Pyle said. Uh, I represent uh, a lot of unions, not just the rubber work, but uh, I represent them primarily in Tennessee, and I would like to say to the general counsels and the various lawyers from the various unions that uh, this problem is not limited to Mississippi. It may not be as refined uh, in other parts of the South as it is in uh, Mississippi, but uh, in my own state, the Amalgamated's had this problem. The ILG's in the struggle. The uh, machinists have had the problem in Paris, Tennessee, the rubber workers in uh, Lewis County, Tennessee. Uh, the same sort of pattern. Uh, one thing that uh, I was successful in doing last year, uh, and I think the lawyers would be interested in this, is I did secure a federal court injunction against the sheriff and chief of police uh, in uh, a community in Tennessee from harassing pickets and the peaceful carrying on of a labor dispute, uh, and I relied on the Civil Rights uh, Act. Uh, I, uh, the case
cases that were referred to this morning by Mr. Sherman for the lawyers that are here, I'd like to give them the citation which I, which I had in my briefcase. The Wooten v. Ola, O-H-L-E-R case is in 303 Federal 2nd, 759. I'd like to refer the lawyers, if I may be professional just for a moment, to another case that's older than that and involves the governor of Connecticut, Baldwin v. the O-U-E, United Electrical Workers. It's in 47 Federal Supplement 225. Uh, I likewise brought the governor uh, into the action that I brought on the basis that he called out the state troops. And uh, in the, under the Tennessee Constitution, the governor has no authority to call out the militia without the uh, approval of the legislature. And we did negotiate the removal of the uh, militia uh, with the governor on the basis that he would be, have been required to go to federal court and explain to the court why he called out the uh, militia. Uh, I'd also like to uh, urge uh, the organizers and those that uh, deal with the National Labor Relations Board not to overlook the possibility of continuous pressure on the various regions for 10J injunctions. That's injunctions that uh, the board can ask for on behalf of a union for a continuous harassment. There has not been much success uh, in that area, but I think it's, uh, if we keep the pressure on the board by continually asking uh, this type of relief that requires approval of Washington, and if we can show flagrant enough cases, I think that we may uh, be able to move some of the regional directors uh, to change their position, or at least uh, take a harder look at this type of immediate relief uh, in regards to very flagrant violations. Of course, as Mr. Uh, Sherman pointed out, uh, this is a discretion of the federal uh, judge and whether or not he will grant this injunction. I understand there's been none issued in uh, Mississippi. Isn't that right, Mr. Oh, yeah, I know there have been. Yeah, well, that's just part. Well, 10Ls. Well, 10Ls are, are, of course, uh, injunctions <coughs> on behalf of the employees. I'm happy to be here at this conference. I'd like to tell Mr. Powell that District 8 of the Rubber Workers, which includes the state of Mississippi, is having a meeting in Memphis next week, and the uh, president of the Rubber Workers will be there, Mr. Bomarita, and Mr. Smith, Art, and Mr. Adams, and myself. Uh, intend to conspire against Mr. Bomarita and try to get him in a hotel room and convince him of the importance of carrying on some of this work that Mr. Powell has so ably outlined and Mr. Sherman. And I hope that uh, we are successful and that when I come down here, I'll enjoy the same exalted position that Mr. Sherman does. That will I will be free myself from, uh, from the non-discriminatory criticism of Mr. Powell. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Barron. Uh, if you want to come down, Warren, would you like to have a word to say? This is Warren Wood with the United Paper Makers. Friends, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, at the outset of Dixon's comments this morning, he said something about his distinguished colleagues at the bar. In all sincerity, after hearing him talk, I would say at least for myself that if I have any distinction in this gathering, it is because people like Dixon Pyle are at my side. I thought his talk was absolutely terrific. Uh, I really don't have much to add to the statements that were made by our very able panelists. Lou Sherman's lucid analysis of the universal case I thought was extremely helpful. Tom Harris, as always, gives a balanced, if perhaps cynical, uh, exploration and critique of the advantages and disadvantages of using one or the other of the available legal techniques, and I've al already complimented Dixon Pyle. I have to go on record, however, with somewhat more emphasis uh, to express my agreement with Dixon Pyle's quick statement that he thinks labor board procedures and remedies are virtually useless. I do not agree with either Mr. Sherman or Mr. Harris in their continuing uh, respect for the virtues of labor board procedures. As a matter of fact, I generally advise my clients to forget about the labor board except for representation cases, except as a court of absolute last resort. 
Now let me explain that for a moment to you. Uh, I'm even longer in this labor law practice than Dixon is. I started in it in 1937, which is 29 years ago, as a lawyer in the labor board office in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, you can give, and continuously thereafter in the South until I went to Washington. I was regional attorney in Atlanta and then later on in New Orleans, which covered the Mississippi region. Uh, the problems that we have today in the labor movement in the South and in various portions of the North, including New England, are almost precisely the same as they were when I was regional attorney in Atlanta and New Orleans. Not very little difference uh, between then and now. And I can give some examples. Back in uh, early 1941, Lige Williams, who was then president of the Louisiana State Federation, came into my office with a couple of girls from the Shreveport office of Southern Bell Telephone Company. And they filed a charge alleging that the Southern Bell Telephone Company had maintained and sponsored and dominated a company union in violation of the then Section 8.2 of the Wagner Act. We moved with industry and I think all due diligence, and I'm not denigrating the present personalities in the board at all, to borrow Lou's phrase, uh, or the personalities then, because I was one of them. Uh, what we moved with all due diligence and we got a quick hearing, and we had a quick, fast trial, and we had all the facts. Well, after that case, which was the last one I tried for the Labor Board, I went to Washington and went with the War Labor Board as executive assistant to the chairman of the War Labor Board, and then I went into the United States Army, and then I went to officer candidate school, and then I went overseas, and I went to Japan after the surrender, and then I came back to Seattle in 1946, October. And one of the first things that I saw when I got into Seattle was a New York Times newspaper, which I was hungry for, and it had a story in it about a recent session, decision-making day in the Supreme Court of the United States. They had just decided the Southern Bell telephone case. And they had just decided that, after all, it was a company-dominated union and should be dissolved. Well, it was promptly replaced by another company union. And it took us until 1949 and 1950 and a lot of organizing efforts to get that union converted into the present CWA after a referendum vote on whether it should become affiliated with the then AFL or the then CIO. So these labor board procedures, let's take Steve Schlossberg's reference to Kohler. He says $15 million later. He didn't add 12 years later. The Kohler case finally wound its way through the courts and into a successful contract. There are advantages to be obtained by the use of labor board techniques, but only, in my opinion, as a very last resort. And let me say just one other thing on, on the subject of the Labor Board, and I, I, I'm really every bit as emphatic on that as Dixon Pyle is. We as labor lawyers are getting just as sophisticated as, as the employer lawyers are on the potentiality for delay in this statute. I've got a case that I'm going up to next week in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which started in 1958. In this case, the papermakers were being raided by a craft union, then the Amalgamated Lithographers, now the International Lithographers and Photo Engravers Association. And we've kept that union from getting to the bargaining table for eight years by the simple device of obstruction. Now, I just don't think, in the kind of a situation that you have here in Mississippi, that the remedies available to you through the National Labor Relations Act are of very much help. And as I said, I advise my clients to forego them unless all else is lost. And it's a court of last resort. And this is not because of the personalities of the people who administer this act. It is simply because it is outmoded. It doesn't do you any good anymore. In other words, gentlemen, we have got to find new tools new legal tools to help the organizer achieve the objective that Lou Sherman so well described, which is ultimately getting the agreement. Now, I am attracted 
by the civil rights suit idea. I am also very familiar as a general counsel of the labor union and counsel for a number of other labor unions with the banker philosophy that sometimes pervades and prevails uh, international headquarters and perhaps even AFL-CIO headquarters. Uh, I'm a little bit tired while we're talking here of having people remind me that some 20 to 25 cents of the per capita dollar which the AFL-CIO receives in Washington goes to financing international operations of the AFL-CIO. I think we have enough amateur secretaries of state in the United States. And I'd just as soon see all of that money going into the financing of the sort of things that we need down here in Mississippi. The civil rights action, the EEOC type action, which Dixon described, I believe up in Grenada. Clarksdale. Clarksdale. Uh, deliberate harassment, damage suit actions, all of these new legal tools should be explored and used to supplement, to add to, and even to replace the traditional and easy tools that lawyers are familiar with. We should explore all of them. You know, a long time ago, a lady newspaper woman or magazine writer that I knew was writing an article for the Kiplinger magazine, Changing Times, which specialized in these how to select or how to do type of articles. And her article was being written uh, on the subject of how to select a doctor if you're a stranger in a particular community. And after doing a considerable amount of research on this, she finally said to me, you know, my whole article can be summed up in the last paragraph. There's only one way, really, to select a doctor that will guarantee you some the best physical, medical treatment that you can get. That's to meet one early in your adult life and grow up with him as a personal friend. Well, I think, in a way, that's about the only way you can select a good lawyer. <coughs> you have to find a Dixon pile, as Bob Starnes did, back in a time like 1946 or 47, and grow up with him. And then you'll have the kind of a man that you have here to help you on these legal problems. Thank you, Warren. Shankman, ACWA. No, we had a, what he's coming up, let me try to advise you something. We had a little get-together last night of all the attorneys, and i never seen so much arguing in all my life. So apparently it did a lot of good. These people are completely different this morning and this afternoon. They were last night. He's busy with his kids, though. Yeah, I see. Yeah. <laughs> Jack. I think there's a conspiracy afoot here, and I'm going to take a suit under the Civil Rights Act myself. Last night, Ed Blair said he brought me down here so I could learn something. Today, I get it from Dixon Piles on a podium, and I submit there's a conspiracy afoot at this meeting. Uh, being the only uh, counsel for a union with a bank, I'm likewise on the defense. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come down here to make any uh, speeches. I came down here to listen, essentially. Uh, I do want you to know that notwithstanding uh, the statements by my good friend Dixon, uh, we have probably one of the largest organizing staffs in the South. We expend the highest proportion that I know of of our income on organizing. We work very closely <coughs> with our organizing department. But no matter how closely we work with them, and I don't take as pessimistic a view of the labor board as my friend Warren does, and I'll tell you why. While it's not going to organize a plant, this is a job that you ladies and gentlemen have to do. We can't do the organizing for you. We have to supply you with tools to assist you in your organizing campaign. And I think we have to develop new tools. Just as times have changed from 37, in the area of the economy of our country, industrialization and automation, 
problem with the strike as a weapon of economic warfare is gradually being diminished as a result of automation, we lawyers have to come up with additional tools. But the point I want to make is this. Ultimately, to get that contract, you do have to resort to economic force. And that involves a strike situation. And in a strike situation, I do believe quite sincerely the question of whether or not the employees are economic strikers as opposed to unfair labor practice strikers makes a big difference whether you people out in the field can get them out on strike. And this can become a very important thing in an unorganized area where you have an available labor, labor pool available to act as replacements to be able to give the people in the field some assurance that you are going to be able to protect the jobs of the strikers when they do go out. We, don't, we lawyers have no panaceas. We have no patent medicines, as my good friend Lou Sherman said. And I do feel that the basic job is still the job of the people in the field. And Dixon, I want you to know that uh, I just don't sit in an office up in New York. I've covered 100,000 air miles last year, traveling around the country in a number of situations. I may not have reached the furnace of Mississippi, but I've reached some other furnaces which are quite as warm in other areas of the country. And the problems are acute here, and I know the frustration, and I say this sincerely, that the people in the field face, when they have to go out <coughs> and fight sheriffs and fight a hostile community, we people who do live in offices essentially are not in a firing line in that regard. But I do feel that all of us here representing unions are not unmindful of your problems. And we are, and I'm sure I'm stating for all of us, appreciative of the job that you're doing. And I just hope that we can continue to help you in the best way we can. And I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say we'll do the best that we can to try to get your job done. Thank you. Let me see. I don't know if I can identify all the attorneys present or not. You are. I'm only the associate general counsel of my union. Uh, the uh, general counsel, Morris Lucian, could not be here, but he asked me to come down here and he said, take copious notes. Now I get down here and I find a speech by Dixon Pyle uh, available to us. I have a copy of the complaint in the universal case, and now we're going to get a transcript. Uh, with all that, I uh, sat back and relaxed and thought I'd uh, tried to absorb as much as I could. Uh, last night I met with the people and uh, as you were told there was quite a bit of give and take last night. But the give and take really were not on the essentials of today's program. And let me say at the outset that uh, uh, I've become increasingly excited about the prospects uh, of a good previously prepared quick action civil rights uh, procedure or suit to be used in circumstances where the community has been mobilized or is mobilizing to bat your brains in as willing servants of the employer. And let me say, as Jack said, that the assumption that Tom Harris made that these circumstances are uh, confined to Mississippi is a real mistake. Uh, we had uh, recently a case involving a seven plant company, Marlene Industries, four plants in Tennessee and three in South Carolina. And this was a throwback to the uh, 30s. Uh, it was almost unbelievable that uh, the types of violence that took place there when our organizers merely attempted to distribute literature near the plant. Uh, there were literally mob actions of 150 people 
being instigated by the plant supervisors with the police standing around uh, paying no attention and, uh, and turning their backs when you ask for protection. We did not think of the civil rights approach. We thought of the 10J approach and we immediately asked the Labor Board for a 10J injunction. They were thoroughly sympathetic. That was last septem September, but they insisted on a um, full investigation and they had a good investigators. They insisted on dotting all the I's and crossing the T's and issuing a complaint. Here it is October or November and we haven't yet got the injunction. So in retrospect, the civil rights approach probably or almost certainly would have been better then, uh, particularly as it does involve the possibility of money damages. Our observation is that some of these communities, you're not dealing with tough-minded bankers and, uh, and uh, sophisticated uh, uh, community leaders alone. You're dealing with a whole spectrum of the business community, which includes storekeepers and, the, uh, and, the, and a local young lawyer and even uh, some people who have a passion for respectability, and that these people might easily crumble uh, at the first sign of a lawsuit uh, by you. So I think that this is, may well be an important adjunct to your other weapon. Now as to the NLRB weapon, uh, I haven't had as long a period as Mr. Wood. I, I've had 21 years, 14 years with the Labor Board and seven with the ILGWU. And those seven with the ILGW, I spent almost as much time in the South as I have in the Home Office. I'm sort of the troubleshooter uh, on NLRB matters. I'm keenly aware that I come into the South and meet with the organizers and the employees in a motel room in a, usually in a large city, and the fact that the Ku Klux Klan is in Gaffney, South Carolina, uh, I don't have to worry about as long as I don't leave the motel room. But I did know there that if our organizers went out, uh, this is a town very close to Ga Gastonia. I did know that if our organizers went out at night, that they were in real physical danger. I do know that they're in danger in Hartsville even today in, the case, in connection with that matter. So as lawyers, uh, and I think this might apply even to our Southern lawyers, we'll never be on the firing line as, as are our organizers and those most courageous people, the people who work in the plant. Because we do know that the blacklist does exist, and we do know that if they lose their job, uh, even if there is a plant within 50 miles that they're qualified, uh, that, that plant knows about them. I've, I've seen nothing to compare with the Southern worker in terms of courage. So my hat is off to the Southern worker and the, uh, the organizers here. Some comments about using the board. I think I'm realistic and I think I agree in the main that the board's procedures in terms of time and the remedies in terms of the need and what it ultimately brings you are really uh, discouraging, almost totally discouraging. If you add to that fact that the caliber of the uh, personnel or the willingness of the personnel uh, to do the job uh, is also discouraging, then you have a very, very discouraging picture. Nevertheless, there are circumstances, including the protection of the employees in case they're fired, uh, and many times you do ultimately get them reinstated with back pay. And, the ba and that is nothing to be sneezed at. I think employees are far better with an 8 uh, a uh, meritorious 883 charge, well investigated and tried, than if you say, well, the board isn't any good, we're no use doing it. All right, so you're dealing with personnel who you feel are not qualified. What we've done has been rather simple. We've done their job for them. Our organizers, I believe, are increasingly sophisticated about <coughs> gathering the information as it occurs and recording it. 
We have lawyers on the staff so that we don't worry about money. We have quite a few lawyers on the staff. We don't worry about ticking the hours up in terms of pay. So the lawyers do quite a, uh, do quite a bit of the original investigation. We take the statements and then we proceed to submit the evidence, not in the form of statements, fully to the regional director in the form of a letter stating everything he could expect to, uh, should find if he sends out an investigator. And we keep on top of it so that we have a fairly good percentage in our union of positive action on the part of the regional directors. And we keep our relationship with the, uh, with the uh, Washington pretty good so that we're not afraid to run to Washington and inform Washington, even as it's being investigated, that an important case lies in the region. And when we request a 10-J injunction, that request doesn't go into the regional director. It goes into the uh, general counsel in Washington, copy to the regional director. And again, we talk to the general counsel at an early stage about this important case. In short, it is, it is tragic, but it is possible a tragic that it's necessary, but it is possible to overcome this, this inertia that exists in the region with the expenditure of money, with the expenditure of effort. Uh, just one comment about Tom Harris. I've heard so many people say that Tom Harris is cynical here. In my view, he's balanced an objective would be a better way of saying it, because with those of us who get on the firing line and who are frustrated by the regional office or by the court are inclined to talk in hyperbole and uh, what can be done and what should be done, uh, and we do not have the problem of weighing it in the light of the other priorities that exist. It's always a joy to me to listen to Tom, because I think rather than being cynical, he helps bring things into perspective. Thank you. I've been down here in Mississippi both as a labor lawyer and as a civil rights lawyer. I've worn both, both hats. As a civil rights lawyer, I've come across many instances where the labor law was not being applied. For instance, here in Mississippi, there is an excellent Workman's Compensation Act. In the course of my travel through the state, I found that where uh, that in certain areas, Negroes who have lost arms for which a Schedule C is provided have not collected for that arm in a like amount as white workers. As a labor lawyer, I now find <coughs> that aspects of the civil rights work that I've done now come close to the functions that I perform in representing the IUE. Well, as far as the Civil Rights Act, my frank opinion has been, and is, that the 14th Amendment pretty much covered the waterfront when it was enacted. And all of the civil rights legislation has not really added very much to it. Now, you've heard a great deal about Section 1983 with respect to action under the color of law. Well, in the civil rights field, They've gone far beyond that, and they've gone into the area of custom and usage. If enough, enough civil rights actions are brought, and enough conspiracies are actually proved, where people will interfere with organization with the expectation that government authorities will intervene, you can successfully pursue a suit under Section 1983. As I listened to Bertie Toko, talk about supervisors engaged in some action involving mobs of people and attempting to interfere with organizational activities, I could not but help with a seldomly thought, help think about a seldomly thought provision uh, in the Taft-Hartley Act, and that's Section 302. Now, Section 302 is very interesting. It's basically directed, we've always thought, against extortion and the improper payment 
to union officials of funds or money by an employer. It goes far beyond that. Section 302, and I commend your consideration of this as an additional tool, provides that it's unlawful for any employer or any person who acts as an advisor to an employer or anyone who acts even in the interest of an employer to pay or deliver money or other thing of value to any employee, and that includes Bernie's supervisors or anyone working for or on the payroll of the company, and it doesn't have to be directly, to pay over to any employee for the purpose of causing such employee, and then the statute goes on, directly or indirectly, to influence any other employees in the exercise of the right to organize or bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing. Now, this kind of a violation under Section 302 is punishable, is considered, is held to be a misdemeanor and punishable by a fine of not more than $10,000 or a year in the can or both. Now, this is not the kind of action that we control in the sense that this is something for the U.S. Attorney to institute pursuant to our sworn information. But it is an available tool and I think would be extremely applicable to many situations which occur here in Mississippi and other locations in the South. Now, as far as uh, the uh, uh, case that we've heard, so it's a case about which we've heard so extensively, the Universal, Camera, the Universal Manufacturing Company case, uh, I'd like to point out that we've had a experience here just this last August, the IUE in Utica. And uh, there uh, we had every aspect that uh, Mr. Sherman described in terms of uh, community pressures, editorials, uh, newspapers working hand in glove with the employer, the mayor, the alderman, tied into a vicious anti-union campaign. It, uh, it was complete and it was documented. We went ahead with an election. We held all of these documents feeling that, well, heck, this election couldn't be validly conducted. We couldn't possibly win. And we'd go ahead and file our election objections and go through the usual course. Much to our surprise in Utica, we won the election. And that, of course, is the end of it. And I understand from Ben Julie here in this room that he has been uh, negotiating with the company and there's every likelihood that a contract will be consummated within about a week, which is extremely <laughs> pleasing to know. That organization here in Mississippi, while it's extremely difficult, and I'll be the first to acknowledge it, is still something that can be realized through ordinary processes. The difficulties that are experienced down here are at times no more acute than occur anywhere, anywhere else in the country. And somehow, and in many situations, we've been able to overcome them. I'm not suggesting that it's easy, and I recognize the difficulties that are involved. But the point is that Mississippi is not that different. I say that because I've lived here, I've worked here, and uh, uh, if you talk in terms of anti-union employers, you talk in terms of employer lawyers who know every trick in the trade, they've got them all over the country. Mississippi doesn't have a patent on that. That's all I have to say. Thank you. We have a Mr. Mike Hugh and a Mr. Paradise yet. like to come to the podium no, I, I I'm going to review some of these problems before the conference so I'm familiar with
chairman and ladies and gentlemen. This has been a very exciting meeting for me. I think I go back maybe about as far as Warren Wood, because I became a trial examiner for the National Labor Relations Board back in 1937. And I heard cases at that time in Alabama and Mississippi and Tennessee and throughout the South. And as has been said, you know the old saying that the more things change, the, the more they're the same. And this is true. Because as has been pointed out, the problems that you're talking about are the same problems that we were dealing with back in the earliest days of the Wagner Act. Now, the reason that this conference is so exciting to me is that we've been thinking about these problems so long that we tend not to think about them. And we tend to sweep them under the table and uh, assume that uh, if we don't get too excited about them, they'll just go away and we muddle along doing the same things that we've been doing over the years, even though they've been ineffectual. And to find a spirit like this developing down at the grassroots, a demand for new approaches, new remedies, something to make the rights that the Wagner Act or the Taft-Hartley Law uh, grant, real. And this, uh, to me, is exciting. And I think that uh, it has stimulated a great deal of interest and a great deal of thought on the part of every lawyer who came here to an extent that he would not otherwise have done. I don't think anybody, in spite of the arguments that we had last night, I don't think there is any lawyer here who would deny the desirability and the feasibility of using the Civil Rights Act in proper situations. And in the kind of situations that Lou Sherman described this morning and some of those that <coughs> Dixon talked about, I don't think that we get any argument from this whole jury box full of lawyers that if you can use the Civil Rights Act in those situations, use it. And there might be some disagreement as to what is an appropriate situation and what is not an appropriate situation in which to do this. But on the basic principle involved, I don't think there is any argument at all. I think, however, we have got to understand that this approach is not a fundamental solution to your problems. And looking at the thing in the perspective of history, it is not going to make a very substantial contribution to the solution of the problem of organizing. Because when you talk about using the Civil Rights Act, what you're talking about is eliminating obstructions to the very commencement, the initiation, the carrying on of organizing activities. But you're not talking about the problem of meeting the program of the anti-union employer and his lawyers who have laid plans so skillfully to prevent union organization, to destroy it if you have it, to obstruct your bargaining if you win an election, and to exhaust every remedy they've got under the law. Now, you've been told by a number of people, and I agree, your problem is not peculiar to Cincinnati, maybe a little more aggravated in certain respects, but fundamentally, it's a problem that is common to many other places. 
And I think one of the best evidences of this is that you're importing lawyers, for example, from, from uh, Louisiana to counsel your Mississippi employers on the techniques that they've used so successfully back in New Orleans in preventing or destroying union organizations. The attorneys for these beer distributors whom the brewery workers struck here in Jackson recently were Coleman and Lang of New Orleans. Now the word gets around among employers as to who are the lawyers who know how to bust unions and their techniques are circulated among the trade on that side of the table and the service of these men will be in demand from your Mississippi employers. So you got a problem of organizing in the face of what is considered lawful obstructive tactics on the part of the employer. Tactics that you can't reach under the Civil Rights Act and tactics that you can't reach under the National Labor Relations Act if they're properly employed. Because employers have a great deal of latitude, as you know, under the NLRB doctrine. So here you are. Now, I would be the last one to say that the remedies afforded under the National Labor Relations Act are effective. For the most part, they are not. However, I certainly would not go along with, with Warren Wood's assessment of the situation, because after all, it's all we've got. When Warren Wood says that he tells his clients to use the Labor Act only as a last resort, what does he really mean? What he means is that if the union hasn't got the muscle to accomplish the result through the use of economic strength, then you go to the Labor Board. Well, nobody would argue with that. If you can get what you want by beating the employer's brains out on the picket line, sure, you're going to do it. But unfortunately, too often, particularly in states like Mississippi and other states in the South, you just can't do that. You strike and you get clobbered. Plant operates with scare. And then you've got a, uh, a war of attrition between the employer and the union. See who can hold out longer. And in too many cases, in this kind of a struggle, the odds are against the union. So whether we like it or not, we have got to use the processes of the labor board. Because there really isn't any other alternative. And this means that for whatever the NLRB processes are worth, you've got to gear your activities with the idea in mind that you may have to use them and get as much protection out of them as you can. And on this, a great deal more can be said. So, to Dixon, for having stimulated the very provocative ideas of smile this conference, I certainly give my personal thanks. It's been a wonderful meeting for me, and I think I've shed a few years just sitting here and listening to it. Thank you very much. Mr. Parrish. Before we open the floor for questions now from the floor, I believe this concludes all of the attorneys. Now, do we have any other attorneys present? I'm glad you don't, but there's one other two that I'd like to mention because it's right down your alley. Yeah. Uh, if I may, I'll just save it from here. In discussing new tools for harassment of employers and power structure type of community situations that you have here in Mississippi, I forgot to mention something which is very close to Claude's heart and to Paul's uh, and to <coughs> Brother Starr's heart. <coughs> that is the Federal Communications Commission. <coughs> I think every organizer here should know that every radio station and television station in the country must file an application for renewal of its license once every three years or at least. <coughs> it must also hold on 
for public reference at its headquarters office copies of that application and other pertinent information. And under new forms just adopted by the FCC, it must also make a survey of community needs when it fashions its programming for filing a license renewal application. Now, as Claude Ramsey did, and the AFL-CIO pushed by him and Starn, Bob Starn did, in the Jackson television situation, they filed a protest to the renewal of the application. The FCC sat on it for quite a while and decided not to direct an evidentiary hearing, but granted only a one-year license renewal. Thereupon, the Universal, the United Church of Christ, the FLCIO went into the Court of Appeals and they reversed the FCC, which was directed by the Court of Appeals to hold an evidentiary hearing. As a result of that action, all of a sudden, the TV stations here, which make about 30% profit on their revenues, became very interested in presenting impartially news on controversial subjects of interest to labor. Almost every one of these towns, relatively small towns, in which you're trying to organize plants has a radio station at least, and probably also has a CATV system which brings in a bunch of television stations. This is another tool or another armament in our arsenal that we ought to be familiar with and should use because these things can be churned out. Uh, protests can be churned out from a farm which just is filled in by the organizers, and we can harass the holy hell out of the power structure in a lot of cities by just going to radio stations and saying, we want on the air, we want to demand equal time, we want to talk back to the employer. I didn't want this conference to finish, Claude, without, without some reference to what you did on that FCC thing. Thank you, Warren. That's very appropriate. <laughs> I might say that, uh, Warren, that we have several people in the audience here, some of our central bodies that have been doing just what you suggested. Uh, see Bill Pollock sitting in the back with the Hattiesburg Central Labor Union. He uh, demanded and got equal time on the local radio station during the 14B debate. So it can be done and we're not doing as much as we should, but we are, some of our people are doing some of these things you suggested. Now before we have the question and answer session, I want to see if I can kind of sum up a little bit what's already been said by the attorneys. and. Uh, to uh, again emphasize the fact that what we're attempting to do here in this conference is to put together a coordinated organizing effort in the state of Mississippi. And in doing that and approaching the effort, we felt that we should bring these attorneys in and discuss with you what we think um, is a new approach, so to speak, from a legal point of view. Proved successful, as we've already heard, from IBEW. And one of our major problems, as I view it in the trade union movement, is that our enemies have studied our actions for many years and have acted accordingly. And it's up to us now to also come up with new devices. And this is what we're trying to come up with here in this country. I gave a couple of addresses up at the University of Mississippi back last July, and in one of those addresses, I reviewed the history and development of the trade union movement in the state of Mississippi, <coughs> briefly. Of course, I couldn't touch on all of the situations that we had. And I'd like to read just a few paragraphs from one of those speeches because I think it's pertinent to the subject at hand question of attorneys, new approaches, and what have you. One of the chief reasons for lengthy organizing campaigns is the number of law firms throughout the South who specialize in fighting organized labor. Many members of these firms have been trained at the expense of the federal government. Many of them learn the tricks of the trade while working in the regional offices of the National Labor Relations Board. These lawyers concentrate on delaying tactics. They feel if a campaign can be dragged on long enough, the workers will throw in the towel and forget about the union. In many cases, the fees paid to these lawyers is fantastic. Even so, the anti-labor employer feels 
He can save money if he can keep a union out of his plant. The plain truth of the matter is, he usually pays the lawyer and ends up with his workforce organized after two or three years. Such a situation occurred in Jackson in 1960. During the latter part of that year, the Carpenters Union started an organizing campaign at Mississippi Products, the largest unorganized plant in the city of Jackson. At that time, over 1,600 people were employed in the plant. This campaign, in addition to costing the Carpenters Union a fortune, set all kinds of legal precedents and records. The governor of the state, Ross Barnett, even got involved at one time. In January 1961, a representative of this union filed a petition with the board requesting a representation election. At this point, MPI hired the law firm of Coleman and Lane of New Orleans who specialized in fighting organized labor. After conducting the usual hearing, the board ordered an election for May 12, 1961. At this point, <coughs> Lang and his associates begun one of the most vicious anti-labor campaigns ever conducted in this state. The race issue was used, along with every other conceivable tactic. The Negroes were told that the Klan would take over if they voted for the Union. The whites were told that the NAACP would take over if the union was voted in. Approximately 60% of the employees were white and the rest Negro. The Jackson Press wrote editorials practically every day against the union, and on May the 12th, the votes were counted. The union lost by a 12-vote margin. The union representative filed objections with the board and requested that the result be set aside and a new election ordered. After several months of investigation, the board upheld the union's charges and ordered another election. Lang and Associates appealed the ruling to the board in Washington. After several more months of delay, the NLRB upheld the regional board and sought another election for March the 22nd, 1962. Again, Lang and Associates went to work. The Clarion Ledger and the Jackson Daily News kept up a steady stream of editorials and even one of the local television stations got into the act. WLBT ran an editorial on the night before the election that probably did more damage than anything else. A week before the election, the governor made it convenient to visit the plant and make a speech concerning the importance of this industry to Mississippi. While he made no mention of the union, the implications were plain enough. When the ballots were counted on March the 22nd, the union lost again by a very close vote. The union again filed charges with the NLRB, requesting that the results be set aside and another election held. Finally, after over a year of litigation, the board ordered another election for June 26, 1963. This time, after finally realizing what was being done to them, the people voted for union representation by a sizable majority. The people in that plant have a union today, but it took over three years and cost over a quarter of a million dollars to put it there. We have no way of knowing how much this campaign cost this company, but we have every reason to believe it was a large figure. We know that the board ordered a number of people reinstated who had been fired for union activity during the three-year period, and we know that almost $40,000 was paid to these workers in back pay. When this figure is added to the money paid out in lawyers' fees and other costs, I suspect MPI also spent close to a quarter of a million dollars. Such law firms as Coleman and Lane have devised a scheme to keep unions out, which goes much further than the one just described. This plan depends upon the company's willingness to pay lawyer fees and lure wage increases to its workforce. This scheme goes to the heart of the collective bargaining process. Under the terms of the Taft-Hartley Act, an employer is required to bargain once a union is certified. However, the law does not provide that concessions must be made. These lawyers therefore advise these companies to sit at the bargaining table and pretend that they are bargaining in good faith. When this plan has been adopted, an employer, by an employer, a strike is inevitable. The object is to force a strike and replace the striking workers with strike breakers. Once the workers have been replaced and the strike broken, 
the company is assured several more years of operation without labor trouble. This was just a couple of paragraphs from that address, and I referred there to numerous situations in the state. Now, we can spend all afternoon talking about them, but since I did refer to the MPI situation, uh, we do have the several people here from that plant, Robert Woodson, Mr. Fitzhugh, and the Brother Parker, and the whole staff of the Cottonies. I'd like for you to stand up, Brother Woodson, and Fitz the business agent and assistant business agent of the local out of MPI that I referred to <coughs> in that address. Uh, I just thought it would be interesting to some of you, some of you read those addresses, that you might help a little bit in evaluating the situation by trying to find new approaches. I think that uh, the meeting here up to this point has been excellent, that the attorneys present have um, put forth a very good uh, uh, suggestion, I think, several different approaches. I don't think that we can concentrate on any particular approach. I think we have to continue staying with the board and that we also should consider the other actions similar to that taken by IBW at Universal. Again, let me remind you, and, and our major problem in this state and certain areas of the state, and we're going to get into this before we get much further along, as the conspiracies existing that are there for the specific purpose of keeping our people from organizing. And once we get the conspiracies out, the employers, when they have to deal with our unions on an equal basis, then the job is going to be relatively easy. This is as we view it. Now, we're going to have a question and answer session. Who wants to throw the first drink? Anybody from the floor got a question to direct it to attorneys? Mr. Tristan. Dixon on that point. It must be remembered that what we're talking about is an action on the color of law which is intended to deprive somebody of his rights under the Constitution. And that means freedom of press, speech, and the rest of it. Uh, 
I want to say something else, and that is that in selecting cases, uh, I think it would be wise to select the most solid case, or what might be called the most outrageous case, in terms of accomplishing a result, rather than starting with cases which may involve the litigation of uh, complex issues. Because I, I think we're always in the same position that we're thinking of using this tool or any other tool in terms of supporting the organizational effort. That's the precise point we sought to avoid in the complaint. Yep. And that is that we were not going in to protect the rights under the National Labor Relations Act because we didn't want to get entangled in the preemption issue. This, uh, this question, frankly, gets down to this. I don't know how many of you saw the Civil Rights Commission hearing here in Jackson a couple of years ago, some of you probably did. I was uh, subpoenaed and testified before that commission, and I made a serious effort before that commission to review many of the things that we're talking about here today that's happened to the members of our movement, organizers being shot at and beat up. I reviewed the universal case and inserted it into the record of that hearing, all of these things that we're talking about, and stated that in Mississippi, we had the civil rights for people other than Negroes being trampled on, namely trade union organizers. This is how simple it is. And what we hope we can come out of this with, frankly, is to protect the rights of our people using the civil rights statutes. There's uh, too many people. In this country, you're under the impression when we talk about civil rights, we're talking about rights for Negroes. Well, I've got civil rights, and so have you. And all we're trying to do is to protect the civil rights of our people, whereby they can organize as spelled out in the National Labor Relations Act. That's all. Any questions? Further questions? There's a man who can write your book right there, Johnny Ray. Come on up to the front, Johnny. Ray with the Upholsters International Union. He's got several campaigns going on in Northeast Mississippi where, where this conspiracy idea originated. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to direct a question to our dear friend and learned counsel here concerning some of the questions that have come up in this case that we have been discussing here concerning the district attorney, the mayor, the chief of police, the sheriff, the postmaster, the co-op uh, manager, the electrical co-op manager, uh, a few more of them that I can't think of offhand in the city of Pontotoc. We have some 250 employees in this plant, and 249 of them, the civil rights, have been infringed on. And I would like to know if these people themselves, if it would be uh, feasible for them to file this civil rights charge as individuals, and what uh, we could hope to gain in the, in the labor movement from a move of this type if the international uh, don't see fit to uh, get into a charge of this type. <laughs> when he said learned counsel, I don't know whether he's talking about me or Lou Sherman. <laughs> and, uh, Professor Eddie Morgan, who was one time dean of the Harvard Law School and later on the faculty at Vanderbilt, he used to come down to the University of Mississippi when John Fox taught evidence there and speak to the evidence classes. And Professor Morgan said that John Fox would get him into the room and then close the door. And he would say, gentlemen, 
in this room is the greatest living authority on evidence in the world today. And Professor Morgan said, I, I never was sure whether he was talking about me or him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Johnny Ray's question uh, in here, I'm not sure whether he talked about me or Lou Sherman. <laughs> he talks about these things. Now, his question is this the script down. One, can the individuals involved in, in this matter file a civil rights suit? The answer simply is yes, and we'll go into it a little bit more. Number two, if they did so, would, would the labor movement reap any benefit from it? Yes, I would assume that they would reap some benefit from it in the fact that uh, if, if these people file suit as individuals, that perhaps next time the labor uh, um, union moved in the Pontotoc to attempt to organize this plan, that these people would be less likely to jump headlong into a campaign to defeat the union. Now then, the Civil Rights Act was <coughs> promulgated to protect the rights of individuals. statutory rights, federal statutory rights. Uh, and, and we have, as Mr. Sherman pointed out, we purposely kept away from the National Labor Relations Act claiming that these rights had been violated for the simple reason that we did not want to raise for our opposing counsel the question of preemption. For instance, Mr. Sister, if we uh, and said they are taking away our rights under the Taft Hartley Act or the National Labor Relations Act as amended. Then, the, as we pointed out this morning, the obvious step for the lawyers to take, and they, they, you must assume that the lawyers on the other side are as well qualified as you are and will, can see these same things that you will see. The, the obvious thing for them to say well, if this is so, that the district court of the Southern District of Mississippi has got no jurisdiction to administer to these rights because Congress, in its wisdom, uh, preempted this field from the district court and placed it in the uh, hands of the National Labor Relations Board, which is an expertise body set up by Congress to handle this. And then we'd be out, uh, out in the cold again back dealing with the, uh, the National Labor Relations Board and the National Labor Relations Act with all of our uh, shortcomings. So for this reason, we, if we, we, we steered clear of that. Now then, in, in Hague versus CIO, where it was, which was, it goes back to the 30s, this same situation was raised except the CIO was a party. Uh, in, in that case, the United States Supreme Court said, that uh, constitutional rights under the 14th Amendment are personal rights belonging to individuals rather than to unincorporated associations such as the CIO was at that time. So they would not let the CIO become a party. Now since that time, the United States Supreme Court has had an occasion on, uh, to look into this on these civil rights cases. For instance, NAACP versus Alabama uh, and CORE versus Douglas Supreme Court seems to be saying at the present time that uh, labor unions, unincorporated associations, or what have you, do have certain interests and certain rights. Now they haven't spelled this out uh, specifically, but this is what we read in to the NAACP versus Alabama and Core versus Douglas uh, that perhaps labor unions can are persons uh, within this. Jack uh, Stackman is getting ready to crank up again, and I want to call your attention to the fact that he and uh, Mr. Paradise both have been using that greasy kid stuff. I hope this answers your question. <laughs> Wisconsin, the 
respect to the abuse of the floating of corporate bond issues by municipalities and their abuse, uh, we've had a recent situation where a one of these uh, developing bonds were issued to a company, was issued, uh, floated rather, and a company went in, a non-union company, and there was no requirement, even under the uh, agreement entered into between the development corporation and the company that they had to continue to operate and they had a clause, escape clause that in the event of a strike, they didn't have to do anything but sit in an idle plant paying a minimal amount of rent. That plant can shut down 100%, right, Ed? In Tennessee, and uh, despite the fact that the community wants to get the plant sold to a union firm which would be willing to take it over or is willing to take it over, the company is sitting on its hands, the workers aren't working, and the city is losing uh, available business. So there is a great abuse. Dixon said it depends on whose ox is being bought as to whether it's socialistic or not. I'd like to put a question to the distinguished experts, and I'll let them decide which should answer the question. Has any consideration been given where there is no violence or there is no action under color of law with respect to uh, the the using the uh, right to work law as a means of uh, suing some of these community groups in terms of uh, violation of the rights of members to join unions. I don't think there's a preemption issue involved in, in this question because I don't think you're necessarily dealing with an employer. And if you are dealing with an employer in a good many cases, you're dealing with an intra-state employer. It's a state law, and I was wondering if possibly where there is community pressure brought to bear interfering with the rights of workers to join a union which I gather is usually the right to work statute, I'm not acquainted with the one in Mississippi, but a good number of them are written in a reciprocal way, that you can't force people to join a union, and likewise you can prohibit that. You can't uh, force them to join a union, but you can't interfere with their rights. Has any good consideration been given to that? Not that I know of, except that the companies have used the uh, right to work law uh, as a basis for getting injunctions, particularly against craft unions when they put up picket, uh, picket lines and you know they got to get them off in a hurry. Uh, <clears throat> the civil rights statutes, as I understood them, provide a remedy for the redress of constitutional rights. Now, it's true, it does not say uh, whether it's federal, it's limited to the federal constitution. I'm, not, I'm talking about a state action under state law. I'm not worried about a violation of the 14th Amendment. If there is an interference, as the professor points out, of the state constitution, would not a civil action lie in state court? Oh, yes. There's no doubt about that. But has that ever been done? It has not been done because, as I read, uh, we got a statute in the, in the same statute now is incorporated in the Constitution. As I read it, the only element of damage that you can have uh, in here is uh, to, for a worker who's been denied a right to file a suit within the time uh, of the statute of limitations, which is one year uh, for his, for damages, which would be relative minor, uh, a minor amount to bring that kind of a suit. The, 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 as far as I know, no union has attempted an injunction. The certain certain uh, uh, employers have used the uh, right to work law uh, for injunctive purposes in here, but I do not think that they have that as a basis uh, for an injunction because you've got a remedy um, uh, at law by suit for damages. So, uh, to me, you can't use the right to work law for an in, for injunctive procedure in the state court. You use it for uh, to recover damages. Is the way I view it. Who would like to comment on it? The only place I know where that has been tried is Texas. Uh, that doesn't mean there aren't other situations. My impression of what happened there, I'm not up on it, was that. Uh, the suit had to be filed in state court, and I think that probably indicates the answer to your question. But 
I'm no lawyer, but I know a little something about court judges in the state of Mississippi, even if it was possible to use the right to work, get an injunction. I doubt this if we've got a judge in Mississippi that would allow the injunction. So we might uh, think about that a little bit. When we get to the point where we got judges in Mississippi that will grant injunctive relief using the right to work law, we won't be having meetings such as this, I can show you that. They don't bother to go after injunction against labor unions where the labor unions are engaged in illegal conduct. They go after damages. The unions don't worry about injunctions, they worry about money. And I'd like to know why we don't reverse it in this situation. Why in your universal case uh, did you only ask for $125,000 altogether as a maximum, including punitive damages? I say this as one who has been sued for $3 million by three girls for alleged, uh, alleged libel here in the South. And I wonder why you were just being such a cheapskate with regard to the damage. <laughs> <laughs> the, re the reason why we did it that way was because we were quite serious about trying to collect that money if we went forward. Uh, these suits which uh, carry interorum amounts, like $3 million, I think are not taken too seriously by the court. I want you to know Julius put all his property in his wife's name. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any other questions? I'm, a a, I'm sorry, IOG. We don't often get free legal advice, so I want to take advantage of the opportunity. I'm a little confused about the answer to the question on the upholsterer situation. With the, the question as I understood it was, could each of 249 individuals file a suit claiming that their civil rights have been violated? And your answer as I understood it was, oh no, that would be preempted. Well, oh, no, no, no. Yes, yes, the answer is yes. Simple, clear, yes. Okay, and then, then the, the reason for not doing so? The reason that, that I haven't filed any suit is I don't have a client or a cause of action yet. And ain't nobody hired me to, uh, to file a suit. <laughs> the question really is, if the case is good enough, would you take it on a contingent basis? <laughs> Quit preaching and going to business. <laughs> Can you imagine anybody who's been able to hold on to his license for 20 years, 26 years, going to promise out in Mississippi on a civil rights suit on a contingent basis? <laughs> that would be grounds to disbar on, 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 on a basis of feeble minded. <laughs> now, either he doesn't know promise out in Mississippi, he's new in the labor <laughs> No, uh, I, I'm sorry if I confused you by answering two questions at the same time. Yes, the individual civil rights uh, are susceptible to being uh, redressed by these civil rights uh, statutes, or you can file what we call class actions, everyone similarly situated. Uh, and, and this is, we, we can do under it also. I hope that answers your question. Now, I hope you don't come up here any more than any country. <laughs> Jack, come on up here. Well, I don't want to ask a question. I just want to comment what uh, Lou Sherman said about the courts. If it was $3 million or a lawsuit of this nature, that they don't look with any seriousness to the thing. I was proud to hear him say that because we were just sued last month by the plant manager as an individual and the and a cooperation for three and a half million dollars, so you've made me feel extremely good here. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, uh, I don't know what uh, what the devil's the matter with Jack Hydrick. We called a conference back here a year or so ago, uh, an organizing conference with organizers, and reviewed with them the, some of the problems and some of the 
techniques being used by employers, and one of those things that we warned them about was be careful about those handbills. Yeah, Jack's done been sued already. So maybe we better have another conference. We have any other questions? Alan, are you ready to begin with your phase of the program? It looks like we're about through with the legal beagles up here. Significant contribution to the discussion, in my opinion. We are very appreciative of the fact that so many of you were able to come down and participate in this conference. Now, the next phase of the program, and we are moving a little bit ahead of schedule. I told you we would probably begin the organizing discussion tonight, but it looks like we're going to have about an hour here, 45 minutes, whereby Mr. Kessler with the organizing department can uh, present to you the, uh, a plan that uh, he and the other members of the staff have been working on to put together a coordinated organizing effort here in Mississippi. Tom, you want to make an announcement? Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm advised by Secretary Treasurer Knight that we have representatives from 31 different international unions at the conference, plus the FFL CIO staff, and of course some of the attorneys. And we have 126 people that have, re that have actually registered for the conference. This is a real good turnout, but much better really than any of us expected. And again, we want to say we appreciate very much the wonderful turnout for this conference. Now, we have with us up here Mr. Williams, E.H. Williams, who <coughs> is regional director for the FLCO in this area. And he and his staff, and Mr. Kessler, have been working for several days on trying to put together a plan of action, so to speak. And I assume that Lige will lead off and that you will introduce Mr. Kessler, Lige, that we're going to yeah. Lige doesn't need mm -hmm. any introduction. I think all of you know him. He's been with us for years and years. This is Brother Lige Williams, Director of Region 7, Brother Williams. <laughs> Brother Ramsey. Uh, attorneys for our different international unions and international representatives and our friends from uh, over the state of Mississippi. I'm not going to take much time at the moment other than to just say that our program has been completed insofar as the joint organized efforts uh, that we expect to work out here in the, the program. But what I want to do at the present time particular reason that we have a record going over there that uh, some of our friends want some tapes uh, on that I'm going to ask our assistant director Al Kissler out of the national office to make a few remarks uh, from our office in Washington which I'm sure will be very helpful to all of us this time I'd like to present Al Uh, well, let me just say briefly that uh, as an introductory remark, that when you analyze the difficulties that confront union organizers in this state, the fact that unions win elections here is a matter for some marvel. And even more amazing to me is the fact that union performance rating in that connection is improving. In the first six months of this year, for example, AFL-CIO unions have won as many NLRB elections as they had in the best full year reported by NLRB since the merger. And they have won through those elections bargaining rights for almost three times as many workers in these first six months as in any entire 12-month period for at least the last six years. Now, I consider that a, tr a tribute 
to the Union in this state, and a tribute to the organizers in this state, and a tribute as the counsel from the International Lady Garment Workers Union reminded us, as a tribute to the workers in this state. You know, when we launch a, an organizing campaign, we ask workers to put an awful lot uh, on the line when the circumstances exist as we know them to exist here. We ask them to put on, their, on the line their jobs, their family welfare, their future in the area, their health, possibly their life, and on what basis? On our word that the union are the answer to their needs. And if we're not willing to go for broke in every campaign, then we don't have a right to ask workers to make that kind of risk. And by going for broke, I mean exploring every possible avenue of approach, whether this means improving our skills as organizers or adopting a cooperative organizing program or becoming more adept at utilizing the board, uh, the NLRB processes, or instituting civil rights suits, whatever it may be, uh, we owe it to workers to explore each of these possibilities. I was very happy as an organizer to hear every lawyer here today say that no matter what else was done in the way of these new or imaginative or ingenious approaches, at the basic ingredient in organizing campaigns remains the process of organizing. That is still our job as organizers. And that's what we want to talk about for the rest of the conference. We want to shift our emphasis to this matter of organizing unorganized workers. Now, even, even though the unions in Mississippi have been doing the type of, uh, of job in organizing that the figures I just gave you indicated, if you look at what is left to be organized in this state, it would suggest very strongly that no matter how well you may be doing, it isn't good enough. We will be analyzing the surveys that were made by some 16 unions represented in this room to organize the targets that those unions designated as high priority targets at the same rate, at the same improved rate, would take 30 years if you continue to organize by paddling your own canoe. And that isn't good enough. So what we are proposing, and have been proposing for some little time here in Mississippi, is that you try to step up the tempo through combining your resources. Now, whether or not it, it will be successful, of course, only time can tell. But I'd like to point out that such a program of a cooperative organizing program in the state of Iowa increased union wins many times over what it had been before the program was started. That in the state of Maine, in one and one half years, 
they brought in 12,000 new members by such a campaign, which is about 12 times your present rate. Los Angeles Co-op Drive has brought in 85,000 members in a little less than four years, about 17 times your current rate. And I'd like to point out that organize, when you organize in Los Angeles, in Orange County, you're organizing in one of the best organized birch reactionary areas in the nation. In a similar program in the Baltimore District of Columbia area, the participating unions have had a significantly higher election victory record than the unions not participating. We have such programs in various stages of development. In Rochester, New York, in Georgia, in Alabama, in Colorado, in Little Rock, Arkansas, in Kansas, Erie, Pennsylvania, <coughs> Columbus, Ohio. Many of your unions are participating in those programs. And what we want to talk to you about today and tomorrow is just such a program in Mississippi. Now, as I indicated, you recall a number of you were at the, at the previous meeting held uh, in this hotel in August. was uh, agreed that the unions uh, present would take the first step toward uh, launching such a program. And that first step in, consisted of making a survey, a realistic survey of the practical potential in this state. That survey has been done. and. Uh, we, we're ready to give a report on it. Go on. Thanks, Al. I appreciate the remarks that Brother Kessler has made here to you today. I want to say, by way of explanation, insofar as our region is concerned, as opposed to Louisiana and Mississippi, we realized the value a long time ago of cooperating fully and very close to the central bodies, state councils in our district. Very proud today to say to you that we are very grateful to the Mississippi State Labor Council for their real interest in the organizing work of this state. We appreciate sincerely the help that we have gotten in the past, and we certainly expect more in the future from our various central bodies throughout this state if we're successful in setting up this coordinated program. And as Alice told you, these programs have uh, been going on for some time throughout the country, and I know that our international unions are all very familiar with them. And I don't know of any state in the Union where there's a greater need for coordination and cooperation in these drives than in the state of Mississippi. All of us that sit here since uh, beginning last night uh, with our attorneys discussing the various legal aspects of trying to remove from uh, the workers in this state the threat of uh, reprisals, uh, going to jail, and just about everything that happened to them, in their attempt to try to give the workers of Mississippi an opportunity to bargain collectively. It's almost unbelievable when you hear these reports coming from these people in Mississippi when you're not yourself subjected to these to this extent. I think it's uh, very timely. I think probably we've uh, neglected a little too long. Coming in here and binding ourselves together and using whatever means is possible 
And I like to think of uh, joining our people together here in Mississippi as kind of gang tackling these people because our staff at, at uh, various times has complained about having to go into these areas where they know that they're not too safe. We are well aware of the schemes that have been contact, concocted by the employer in certain parts of Mississippi. Now, we don't believe that it's as bad in all parts of Mississippi, it is in certain parts. Now, these places where this is most prevalent, where we've had all these things to happen, we're living in 1966. It's almost unbelievable that uh, these things do happen. We in the Department of Organization are very much encouraged in the last year or two. We're having greater success in the last year than several years uh, prior. We find that today there's more interest in the among the unorganized workers than somehow ever has been before in a very long time. For instance, down in the city of New Orleans, we find the greatest interest that we, we didn't really expect to find. And we're having some real good success among the very low paid people. People that are living on the very cheapest of wages. And it's been most encouraging in our campaign in New Orleans to find that we've been able to arouse the community uh, to the cheap wages there in New Orleans. And we're getting all kind of help from the, all of the community, the citizens of New Orleans, and uh, because they don't believe that uh, there should be any kind of wages like that at this time, they can well understand that people can't live on this kind of wages. I think Mississippi's paid a very large price for the low wages that prevail in this state. And I can't understand the thinking of the people who are supposed to lead in government and in all walks of life in this state that are content to let the, the prevailing conditions exist in Mississippi. I can't see their thinking, I can't see why they would want this sort of thing, because certainly there's no real good sense to it, and I don't think there's any good economic sense to it either, so it seems to me that maybe we could do something about it. Frankly, our department is willing to do all we can, and we've committed that. We're now at the point of going into the program that we've worked on for some time to present to you. We've been able to get the cooperation of the international unions that are represented here in submitting those uh, different industries as targets throughout the state. Our assistant director, Starnes, will be in charge of this coordinating job here, which I'm certainly glad he is, uh, because I know he's going to have a pretty good job. But he's done a real good job in getting all this together, and we get the program uh, prepared for you, and in this time, before we go into the a lot of discussion on it, uh, which I understand will be tomorrow, I would like at this time to present Brother Robert Starnes, who is assistant director in his uh, station here in Jackson, Mississippi, to outline to you what has been done with reference to outlining the coordinated program that we'll be talking about for the rest of this conference. Brother Starnes. Director Williams, Director Kistler, President Ramsey, honorable members of the legal profession, international union officers, fellow members of the trade union movement, and guests. I said something there that reminded me of a little story about the legal profession. It seems in the state of Kentucky, a trial was in progress, a 
and the attorney was vigorously trying to cross-examine the witness, a rather elderly witness, <coughs> one who was a reluctant witness and who could almost be termed a hostile witness. The attorney was having trouble developing any information at all in getting any answers to his questions. So he finally decided he would go around and try to come in the back door. He had asked him some innocuous questions and try to get him off guard. So he asked him where he was from. He asked him where he was born and two or three things like that. And he says, I see that... Uh, they call you Colonel. Are you a Kentucky Colonel? Well, they've got an answer to that. Yes, sir. <clears throat> well, he said, tell me, if you please, what does that Colonel mean? He said, that don't mean a damn thing. It's just like honorable in front of a lawyer's name. <laughs> Now, Dixon Piles will understand me because uh, I keep the needle out for him quite a bit. I was talking to him the other day and I was talking about some of these Mississippi judges we have. And the fact that I thought some of them were pretty poor. And I wondered how they got to be a judge, having as little ability as they apparently did have. And Dixon said, I can explain that. Well, I wasn't surprised at his answer because I haven't found many things that he couldn't explain <laughs> or that he didn't think he could explain. <laughs> well, I said, all right, tell me about these judges. Well, he says, Bob, it's like this. He says, you know, when we get out of law school in Mississippi or when a lawyer is admitted to the bar in Mississippi, he's given a sack of marbles. And every time he makes a mistake from then on, we take a marble away from him. And finally, when he loses all his marbles, we make him a judge. <laughs> I think Dixon might have had something there. And I'd like to say now seriously that I want to add my thanks to everybody else's thanks for what I think is a wonderful job which has been done by the legal talent coming into this state. We've all enjoyed it. I think we've gotten something from it. And I hope we've been able to get some ideas on some new tools which might be used to help in this most important job of organizing. Because we know the tool we've been depending on, the National Labor Relations Board, has gotten to be a broken crutch largely. Now back to the business at hand. After our last meeting on the subject of organizing, we sent out a letter and we sent out a survey form to a number of national unions. And we asked that the proper person in that national union execute the survey form. And list on that form eight or 10 prime organizing targets in the view of that particular international union and to list those targets on the form in the order of importance to that union. Well, we have received 16 completed survey forms. Three or four other unions indicated an interest in our planning, but did not send a form in. And I noticed that there are one or two additional unions have representatives present here today who didn't either send in a letter or a form. So, of the 16 forms which we received, <coughs> Those forms named 185 different targets 
or organizing prospects or situations in which these unions were interested in seeing organized. Those 185 situations involve approximately 38,000 people and they embrace 15 different industrial classifications. Now we tried to pinpoint on a map where these different plants were located, where these different situations are. And we find quickly and easily that they fall into two categories insofar as geographic location is concerned. One area is in the northeastern part of the state, the northeastern corner, embracing such towns as Columbus, Tupelo, Corinth, Okalona, Pontotoc, New Albany, where incidentally <coughs> the upholsterers union, Johnny Ray and his staff, the rebel workers, have campaigns underway today and where the Amalgamated Clothing Workers has just finished a campaign. The other area is, you might say, located in and around Jackson, Mississippi. Jackson and an area 100 miles around. That includes such towns as Meridian, uh, Vicksburg, Greenwood, Greenville, <coughs> excuse me, Columbia, Hattiesburg, Monticello, that's the town I was trying to think of. Columbia, Monticello, and Vicksburg being three places where paper mills are being built and we know there's going to be an organizing interest in there soon. So if we visualize the thing, there would be two areas of concentration, the Jackson area and the Northeast Mississippi area. <coughs> now, I am sorry that more unions didn't complete the survey and send it in. I understand that sometimes a union doesn't want to because they don't want to disclose what they might have in mind, and I can understand that. And I sympathize with it. I think had we gotten a few more that I'm satisfied, <coughs> satisfied in my own mind who have an interest in this, that, or the other plant, we might well have, might well have close to 50,000 people involved, perhaps in exactly the same two areas. Now we hope when we get this thing moving, we hope everybody will get in the boat. We hope that where one or two unions have indicated an interest in the same plant or plants, it might be possible to work out an agreement so that there will be no ju jurisdictional squabble because I think there are enough plants here and enough plants around this state for everybody to get some, nobody to get all. And let's get on with the job in the state of Mississippi of organizing those people who are unorganized. Let's get on with the job of stopping, and I want to say this for the benefit of the lawyers again, stopping the practice of, and this is a specific example I'm going to give you, a plant <coughs> getting ready to locate in a given area, negotiating with the Industrial Development Foundation or Industrial Development Committee or Commission or whatever they term it, arose by any other name, and just before the final conclusion of negotiations, which would result in the flotation of a BAWI bond issue, some bright-eyed boy on the Industrial Committee will say, do you people have a union in any of your other plants? I'm talking about two or three specific towns, and I can name them. 
And the answer is yes, we have unions in our other plants. And do you think you're going to have a union here? Undoubtedly we will. Well, now, wait a minute. We haven't got any unions in this town. We don't want any unions in this town. And if you're going to bring an old stinking union down here, maybe you better look for some other place to go. We want to stop the practice. Another co a concrete example. A pipeline company came to the edge of a county recently laying the pipeline for a gas transmission company. At the edge of the county line, the Board of Supervisors met the contractor. Said, what are you paying these people to dig this ditch and insulate that pipe and put it in, there, in that hole and cover it up? And he told them, oh, you can't pay that in this county. We don't have anybody making that kind of money here. You make everybody in this town dissatisfied, and this whole county dissatisfied man says, well, I'm going to have to pay that money or my men are not going to work. The answer was, well, they're not going to work because you're not coming across the county and pay that kind of money. So the solution was the contractor went to his men and explained his problem, and he cut their wages to conform to what the county board of supervisors said, and when he got across the county, he gave them a bonus to make up for it. See if you can find some civil rights violations and constitutional violations and that kind of foolishness. Now I'm saying to you what I used to say to Dixon Piles, and I'll say this one, sit down and shut up. <clears throat> 20 years ago, Dixon used to start out telling me, Bob, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do something else, and I'd say, Dixon, dadgummit, you're not hard to tell me what I can do, you're hard to keep me out of jail. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Now, before we go any further, I would like to introduce the members of our staff who are here. And to then I think we'll need about 15 minutes to recess, according to <coughs> Brother Ram, because I'm going to let him talk about that. Uh, Brother Mullins, are you here? Joe Mullins? There's one of them. Some of you people just get to know him. But I'm going to uh, pose a question to the conference myself. I outlined to you this morning a rough agenda uh, that we, I would propose to handle the conference. Under this agenda, we had planned to recess at 4 o'clock this afternoon and come back at 6.30 tonight, giving you a, a break in there, and serve coffee, and the, the, beer, the, the beer boys are going to furnish you beer back here, and it's ready to go, I imagine. Now, then some mention made here that if you would rather recess for a short period and come back and stay a couple of hours and have the evening off, so I'm going to leave it up to the people present. How do you want to do it? Well, let's explain to you what the agenda was going to be, and I'm sure that some of you made your plans in accordance. Next Thursday's not going to be too late to go today. Hmm? Well, what I planned, what we had, now if you want to go a little later than that, uh, some some thought they might you might like to have the evening off or something, but uh, I didn't think that since you were here that you could go much in a place much anyhow. We might as well work and get out early tomorrow. This was my thinking when I put the agenda together. And anyhow, if you're going to drink beer and coffee back there, it's going to take more than 15 minutes, you know. Well, even 30 minutes, of course, I've got, uh, I've got two hours and a half allowed here now, is what I've got. Come back at 6.30. Hmm? You're going to have to eat. You're going to have to eat. And you've been sitting here for a long time already. This was my thinking on it. Give you a break and get out and get your dinner and come back at 6.30. Is this satisfactory? Okay. All right, we got a few announcements to make now. Don't everybody get up and leave. Just a minute. Uh, <clears throat> first, please, don't, just don't, don't be afraid. I'm not going to bite you. Uh, we have a photographer, and we'd like very much to give a couple of good shots. Wait a minute, Dixon, Jack, Jill, and all of them. Uh, and the photographer has told me that in order for him to do justice, 
everybody would have to move in closer this way and come up from the back. Now, if you'll do that, then we'll get your picture if you'll say cheese or chicken or something. Um, why, we'll let you go after I get through with you, but I ain't through with you. Instead of coming up toward the front, have him go back toward the back and let me shoot down from here. He says back up, but come in closer. So you people on the front will need to get back. Take, take your chair with you if you need to. So you'll have, give him more room up here. See, the shots scatter better. Give your shots a chance to scatter and hit more of you at one time. So everybody move in off of the sides and move back. Go back a little far. That's right, back. You people on the first two rolls, if you can. We hate to ask you to do this, but.